Lucifer Means Lightbringer presents The Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire The Bloodstone Compendium Chapter 5 Tyrion Targaryen Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire podcast. We've got a great episode for you today, which I think you guys are really going to enjoy. We're experimenting with format again. Last time we tried a chapter-centric episode, and this time we'll be keeping the focus primarily on one character, Tyrion Lannister, who, for my money, is a Targaryen bastard, born of King Aerys II Targaryen and Joanna Lannister. Why do I think this is so? Well, for a start because of passages like this. When the magister drifted off to sleep with the wine jar at his elbow, Tyrion crept across the pillows to work it loose from its fleshy prison and pour himself a cup. He drained it down and yawned and filled it once again. If I drink enough fire wine, he told himself, perhaps I'll dream of dragons. When he was still a lonely child in the depths of Casterly Rock, he oft rode dragons through the nights, pretending he was some lost Targaryen princeling or a Valyrian dragonlord soaring high over fields and mountains. Once, when his uncles asked him what gift he wanted for his name day, he begged them for a dragon. It wouldn't need to be a big one. It could be little, like I am. His uncle Jerrion thought that was the funniest thing he had ever heard. But his uncle Tygett said, The last dragon died a century ago, lad. That had seemed so monstrously unfair that the boy had cried himself to sleep that night. Yet, if the Lord of Cheese could be believed, the Mad King's daughter had hatched three living dragons, two more than even a Targaryen should require. The quote you just heard from A Dance with Dragons is basically slapping us about the face with a rubber chicken that looks like a dragon. And it's not the only one. What we'll be doing today is examining all of Tyrion's personal symbolism— with a particular eye on anything that could be a clue about Tyrion's potential Targaryen lineage. There's a terrific A plus J equals T thread on Westeros.org, and that's Ares plus Joanna equals Tyrion, and that covers all the basic logistical elements of this theory, and I highly recommend that as supplemental reading material. Now, I won't be covering all the logistical elements of the theory, except to say that the world of ice and fire seems to have gone out of its way to suggest that Joanna and Ares were in fact in the same location sometime in the right window for Tyrion's conception, and also that Ares was often said to have a thing for Joanna, and that he took liberties at the bedding during her wedding to Tywin. Instead, what we'll be doing is attempting to provide evidence in support of the theory that Tyrion is half Targaryen through the use of mythical astronomy and a little study of those metatextual hints that Martin is so fond of. We'll talk about demon monkeys and hellish gargoyles, and we'll consider what Tyrion's symbolism says about his eventual role in the endgame of the series. On the way, we'll deviate into talk of Winterfell and young Brandon Stark, and we'll start to get to the heart of a burning question that everyone should have asked themselves at one point or another. What do Azor High and Lightbringer, legends from the Far East, have to do with a story that is fundamentally about Westeros and the Starks, as well as the related question of, is there a connection between a Zor High wielding Lightbringer and the last hero wielding something remembered as Dragonsteel? Joining me on the podcast today to perform the readings from the text will be two of my dear friends, Lady Nightwind, whom you all know and love, and the talented Mr. Paige Lawrence, whom you all love in short order. Thanks to both of them, and thanks as always to Animals as Leaders for allowing us the privilege of playing their music on the podcast. Look them up online if you haven't already. They're terrific. Thanks to Mr. George R. R. Martin for writing these wonderful novels, and thanks most of all to you, the listener, reader, and downloader. The matching text of these podcasts can always be found at lucifermeanslightbringer.wordpress.com, where you'll also get a few images and links. Warning! There will be spoilers of all types. I generally write from the standpoint which assumes that most listeners and readers will be in taking all of the Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire media, show and books. Today we'll be discussing episode 2 of the newest season of HBO's Game of Thrones, season 6, 
So fair warning for people who are trying to ignore the show. And I did think that I was going to try to ignore the show this season, but it just seemed like it was going to be impossible. So here we are. I don't usually talk about the show on the podcast, but in this case, it's hard to ignore. So we'll be doing a little bit of show talk today. We'll also quote a bit from Tyrion's Winds of Winter sample chapter, although I'll keep that at the very end for people who want to avoid those uh, T-Wow sample chapters. So, about that episode, and Tyrion's scene with the dragons. If you didn't see it, Tyrion dares to go into the dragon chamber under the Pyramid of Marine, tells the dragons his story about wanting a dragon for his birthday, which was taken from the quote I led the podcast with, by the way, bravo HBO, and then Tyrion is able to remove the collar chains binding the dragons without being eaten. So now raise your hand if you watched that scene and you thought to yourself, that guy is a mother Targaryen, because I know I sure did. I've been a believer for a while now, so it's pretty easy for me to see the dragons being friendly, or at least tolerant of Tyrion, as a pretty good clue pointing in that direction. Most people took it for a sign that he would probably at least be a dragon rider if he wasn't an actual Targaryen. Now, the show has not spent time establishing the sort of criteria about who can ride a dragon that's in the books. And even in the books, we don't know for sure exactly whether having Targaryen or Valerian blood is absolutely necessary to bond with dragons. It certainly seems to help, and it may in fact be necessary, but we don't know for sure. There is some ambiguity raised by the tale of Nettles in The Princess and the Queen, She seems to be able to tame a dragon purely through feeding its sheep day after day for about a month. However, she may be of distant Targaryen ancestry. Disclaimers aside about who can ride a dragon and who can't, I really think it makes a lot of sense for Tyrion to be the son of Mad King Aerys and Joanna Lannister, and I think the clues for this are abundant. I also think it makes sense for him to be a Targaryen if he's going to be a dragon rider, and I think it's pretty clear George wants him to be a dragon rider. After all, We know he's George's favorite character, and probably the one which contains the most of George's own personality. And as you saw in the quote above, and as we'll see in the following quotes, George has written him to have dragon dreams, dragon associations, and just plain old dragons on the brain. A little earlier in the chapter, cited above, where Tyrion drinks fire wine and hopes to dream of dragons, George hits us with another strong clue as Tyrion thinks to himself about Illyrio's unbelievable tales and promises. Next you will be offering me a suit of magic armor and a palace in Valyria. Tyrion is a lost Targaryen princeling, or Valerian dragonlord, who rides dragons through the night, has a palace in Valyria, and wears a suit of magic armor. Got it? Good. Case closed. Thanks for coming, everyone. Now, many have noticed that the vision that the Red Priest Makoro sees of Tyrion snarling amidst various types of dragons may well imply that Tyrion himself is a dragon. Have a look, and this is from A Dance with Dragons. Someone told me that the night is dark and full of terrors. What do you see in those flames? Dragons, Makoro said in the common tongue of Westeros. He spoke it very well, with hardly a trace of accent. No doubt that was one reason the High Priest Benero had chosen him to bring the faith of Relore to Daenerys Targaryen. Dragons, old and young, true and false, bright and dark, and you, a small man with a big shadow, snarling in the midst of all. Dragons and Tyrion. Why is Tyrion in the midst of dragons here? He doesn't sound like a victim either, but rather more like a dragon himself. He's got a big shadow and he snarls. Sounds like he's part of this great dragon dance to me. If nothing else, this quote indicates that Tyrion's fate will be intertwined with various types of dragons and dragon people. Although a lot of Tyrion's dragon associations are found in the appropriately titled A Dance with Dragons, they actually appeared all the way back in the first book. What are you reading about? He asked. Dragons. Tyrion told him. What good is that? There are no more dragons. The boy said with the easy certainty of youth. So they say. Tyrion replied. Sad, isn't it? When I was your age, I used to dream of having a dragon of my own. You did? The boy said suspiciously. Perhaps he thought Tyrion was making fun of him. Oh yes, even a stunted, twisted, ugly little boy can look down over the world when he's seated on a dragon's back. Tyrion pushed the bearskin aside and climbed to his feet. 
I used to start fires in the bowels of Casterly Rock and stare at the flames for hours, pretending they were dragon fire. Sometimes I'd imagine my father burning, and other times my sister. Jon Snow was staring at him, a look equal parts horror and fascination. Tyrion guffawed. Don't look at me that way, bastard. I know your secret. You've dreamt the same kind of dreams. No, Jon Snow said, horrified. I wouldn't. This quote really stands out when you reread it. Tyrion stares into fires and dreams of riding dragons and burning people. What the hell is that? It's the sort of behavior we'd expect from a red priest or a Targaryen, quite frankly. In addition to this startling revelation of Tyrion's childhood obsession with dragons, I think George is doing a little tricky wording thing in this passage from A Game of Thrones, taking advantage of ambiguous phrasing to imply a double meaning. Tyrion lists two kinds of dreams that he had as a boy, dreams of riding dragons and dreams of burning his family in dragon fire. Then he says to John, you've dreamt the same kinds of dreams, without really specifying which dreams he's referring to. Now, the reader is led to assume that the meaning has to do with taking vengeance against a family that doesn't quite accept you, as John and Tyrion are both outsiders amongst their family. And this is certainly the main intent of the passage. But it can also be read, because it's written ambiguously, to imply that John too, has dreamt of dragons. Jon Snow is, of course, in all probability a secret Targaryen himself, so this interpretation would make a lot of sense. Tyrion specifically mentions staring into the flames and seeing visions of a sort, again, very like a red priest, and this chapter actually ends with John doing the same. One by one, the company drifted off to their shelters and to sleep, all but Jon Snow, who had drawn the night's first watch. Tyrion was the last to retire, as always. As he stepped into the shelter his men had built for him, he paused and looked back at Jon Snow. The boy stood near the fire, his face still and hard, looking deep into the flames. Tyrion Lannister smiled sadly and went to bed. Look, it's Jon Snow, staring into the fire and perhaps having the same kind of dreams. Now, I'm actually not suggesting that Jon has had literal dragon dreams, as he's never mentioned any. But I think the wording here might be implying the potential shared dragon lineage between these two would-be heads of the dragon. John does have a waking, dreamlike, almost vision of dragons in A Dance with Dragons, however, which we'll get to in a moment. But first, we need to talk about dragon dreams themselves, what they are, and what they imply. I Dream of Dragons The phenomena of the dragon dream generally refers to a dream about dragons, duh. But more specifically, it refers to the idea of a Targaryen dreaming of dragons which do not exist. After the Targaryen dragons went extinct some 150 years ago in the story, members of House Targaryen continued to dream of dragons, even people who had never seen one. Maester Aemon confides as much to us while he is on his deathbed in Braavos, in a very memorable scene from A Feast for Crows. I remember, Sam. I still remember. He was not making sense. Remember what? Dragons. Eamon whispered. The grief and glory of my house they were. The last dragon died before you were born, said Sam. How could you remember them? I see them in my dreams, Sam. I see a red star bleeding in the sky. I still remember red. I see their shadows on the snow, hear the crack of leathern wings, feel their hot breath. My brothers dreamed of dragons too, and the dreams killed them, every one. Sam, we tremble on the cusp of half-remembered prophecies of wonders and terrors that no man now living could hope to comprehend. Or... Or... said Sam. Or not. Or yes, let's comprehend them. Eamon pretty much lays it out here. There's something in that Targaryen blood which causes them to dream of dragons, even people who have never seen them. And it's such a visceral experience... 
not only seeing them, but hearing the wings cracking and seeing their shadows on the ground as they fly overhead. Do you know what a dragon's wings sound like? Now, unless Maester Aemon has been to one of those illegal wyvern hunting expeditions you hear so much about in Sothorios, I'm not sure how he would know what leathern wings sound like. It's pretty hard to dream of something you've never seen or heard in such detail. Aemon even refers to his dreams of dragons as memories, and Martin has Sam call our attention to the strange wording and the mystery of remembering or dreaming of something you've never seen, just to make sure we take notice. And here we are, noticing. Aemon also dreams of the Red Comet, interestingly enough, which he also has not seen. This might be a clue that the Red Comet is tied to the magical legacy of House Targaryen, just as dragons are. I've certainly proposed as much. This is also a basic clue that comets can be dragons. Notice how Aemon seamlessly mentions the Red Comet in the middle of his diatribe about dragons, as if it too were a dragon. He said, I see them in my dreams, Sam. I see a red star bleeding in the sky. I see their shadows on the snow. Dragons, then the Red Comet, then dragons again, because they are the same thing, in a certain sense. This is old news to us now, but when Martin wrote this, Nobody had caught on to the Red Comet moon disaster long night thing yet, so he was presumably still trying to clue people into that. Now the Baranas trail, I'm sure he'll make the clues more cryptic from here on out. Chuckle, chuckle. The line about the dragon's shadows on the snow is really fascinating if you think about it. It matches Melisandre's vision of the dragons fighting in the snow, and the logical conclusion here would be that these are references to the dragons fighting the others at some point, in some fashion. Eamon may well be having a prophetic dream here, without even realizing it. I've never heard anyone raise that possibility, but ask yourself, why does Eamon see dragons in the snow? When Mel sees them in the snow, it kind of makes sense because she's at the wall, and we all know that she believes you need a dragon to fight the others. But we don't really know what Eamon believes about fighting the others and dragons, and Eamon is gone from the wall when he has these visions. I think he very well might have been receiving a vision of the future here, just as Melisandre probably did. As for these dragon dreams being the grief of his house and the death of his brothers, Aemon seems to be referencing his brothers Aegon V, that's Egg of Duncan Egg, and the monstrous and insane Aryan Brightflame. King Aegon V's obsession with dragons led to the death of his friends and family, as well as himself, at the tragedy of Summerhall where an attempt to hatch dragon's eggs turned to farce and tragedy, while his older brother, Arian Brightflame, killed himself drinking wildfire, thinking that he would transform into a dragon. Aemon seems to be implying that both of them experienced dragon dreams, and this idea is reinforced by the following passage from A Storm of Swords. This is Alistair Florence speaking to Davos in the dungeon of Dragonstone. This talk of a stone dragon... Madness, I tell you, sheer madness. Did we learn nothing from Arian Brightfire, from the Nine Mages, from the Alchemists? Did we learn nothing from Summer Hall? No good has ever come from these dreams of dragons. Arian's foolishness came from dreams of dragons in a general sense, and quite probably in a specific sense. There's also a cool line about Arian from Jamie in the bathtub scene from A Storm of Swords, and we also get mentions of Mad King Ares, dragons, and fire transformation. The Targaryens never bury their dead. They burn them. Ares meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all, though if truth be told, I do not believe he truly expected to die. Like Arian bright fire before him, Ares thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn all his enemies to ash. Now, we don't know if Ares specifically had dragon dreams, but it sure seems possible. Prophetic abilities and gifts of magical sight are often thought to be tinged with madness, both in the real-world concept of shamanic ecstasy and in A Song of Ice and Fire and many other works of literature, and Ares was plenty mad. It seems quite possible his delusions about dragon transformation may hint at the same type of dragon dreams that have led so many Targaryens down the path of madness. I'm not saying it's the sole reason for his madness by any means, and just saying it could be mixed in there. What's especially interesting is how closely this statement from Jaime about Ares matches what Ares' daughter Daenerys eventually did. She was reborn in a great funeral pyre and woke dragons. As we saw in the last episode of our podcast about the mountain and the viper, 
John the Fiddler, a.k.a. Damon the Second Blackfire, had the gift of prophetic dreams and dreamt of a dragon hatching at White Walls, though it turned out to be Egg coming into his own as a Targaryen. The poor fiddling dragon neither hatched a dragon nor transformed into a dragon, or even much of a warrior, or jouster, or leader. Okay, so we won't pile on. It didn't go very well, suffice it to say. As Gorgon of Old Geese says, prophecy will bite your prick off every time. And apparently that's true even when the prophecy is valid. Maybe especially when the prophecy is valid. Now, John the Fiddler may never have stood a chance at sitting the Iron Throne, but he most definitely dreamt of dragons which did not exist and which he had never seen. Of course, the best example of Targaryen's dreaming of dragons that don't exist yet would be Daenerys herself, who twice dreams of Drogon before his dragon hatches. Success! Finally! Of course, Danny might have been led to perform an abomination, blood magic and human sacrifice, but hey, they hatched, right? The dragon dreams help guide Danny's course of action and eventually lead to her successful attempts to call forth her children from the pyre, just as the dragon dreams of Aegon V, John the Fiddler, and all the rest created within them a longing for dragons. The point is, dreaming of dragons is something Targaryens do. Targaryens and Tyrion. Outside the litter, night had fallen. Inside, all was dark. Tyrion listened to Illyrio's snores, the creak of the leather straps, the slow clop-clop of the team's iron-shod hooves on the hard Valyrian road. But his heart was listening for the beat of leathern wings. That was from the same chapter in Dance that we pulled from earlier, as Tyrion drifts off to sleep full on firewine. Later in that same chapter, Tyrion actually has a dragon dream right on screen. That night, Tyrion Lannister dreamed of a battle that turned the hills of Westeros as red as blood. He was in the midst of it, dealing death with an axe as big as he was, fighting side by side with Barristan the Bold and Bittersteel as dragons wheeled across the sky above them. This dream is mostly remembered for its end, when Tyrion has two heads, one laughing and one weeping. Now, I believe that is a reference to Nissa Nissa's cry of anguish and ecstasy, since Tyrion is a moon child in the Azor Ahai Reborn sense of the phrase. The idea of Westeros itself running red with blood harkens back to the symbolic motif of the blood tide that we've talked so much about, the one which goes back to Mithras and his slaying of the white bull which washes the earth in blood. But also notable in the stream is the presence of dragons. Tyrion has never seen a dragon, and yet he dreams of them here, and actually all through his life. He dreams of them frequently as a boy, as we saw in the previous quotes. Then, as an adult, he tells Jon Snow that, quote, I seldom even dream of dragons anymore. There are no dragons. But even the word seldom here implies that he does still occasionally have them. And sure enough, by book five, he's dreaming of dragons again. He even sees them in the clouds. The clouds in the sky were aglow, pink and purple, maroon and gold, pearl and saffron. One looked like a dragon. Once a man has seen a dragon in flight, let him stay at home and tend his garden in content, someone had written once, for this wide world has no greater wonder. Tyrion scratched at his scar and tried to recall the author's name. Dragons had been much in his thoughts of late. Tyrion just seems to have dragons on the brain. He dreams about them, he reads about them, he sees them in the clouds. In my opinion, Tyrion's dragon dreams and the increasing presence of dragon-related themes in his storyline are perhaps the strongest evidence that the blood of the dragon does indeed flow through his veins. The only other characters we ever hear of dreaming of dragons seem to have Targaryen blood, so far as I can determine. You might recall that in the prologue of A Clash of Kings, we learn that Princess Shireen dreams of dragons eating her. Shireen is a Baratheon, but... She inherited a bit of the dragon blood from her great-grandmother, Rael Targaryen, who married Stannis' grandfather, Orman Baratheon, so it may be that she's turned up a bit of that Targaryen prophetic dreaming ability. Now, Targaryens do occasionally have a more general gift of prophetic dream, which the dragon dreams seem to be but one manifestation of. Daenys the Dreamer, author of Signs and Portents, famously dreamt of the doom of Valeria twelve years before it occurred, giving the ancient ancestors of House Targaryen time to relocate to Dragonstone and survive the doom. 
John the Fiddler not only dreamt of a dragon hatching, but also of Dunk wearing the white armor of the King's Guard, a thing which did come to pass years later. While this prophetic gift is certainly not exclusive to the Targaryens by any means, it does appear that the dragon dreams themselves might be the sole province of those who contain the blood of the dragon. Even if this isn't a hard and fast rule, we have definitely been shown repeated instances of Targaryens who have never seen a dragon having vivid dreams of dragons which are more like memories of real experiences, so it seems likely that this is a connection Martin has intended to create in the mind of the reader. From a narrative standpoint, I just don't think it makes sense to give a character like Tyrion repeated occurrences of dragon dreams unless he has a dragon heritage, especially in a universe where it's been well established that dragon people dream of dragons in a prophetic way. Sometimes, the simple answer is the right one. Tyrion probably dreams of dragons because he probably has Targaryen blood. Now, about that waking dream-like thing of Jon Snow's that I mentioned a minute ago. This is Jon having a conversation with Val about Manson Dalla's baby, soon to be named Aemon Battleborn. And isn't that a cool name? And this is from A Dance with Dragons. See that he stays safe and warm, for his mother's sake and mine, and keep him away from the Red Woman. She knows who he is. She sees things in her fires. Arya, he thought, hoping it was so. Ashes and cinders. Kings and dragons. Dragons again. For a moment, John could almost see them too, coiling in the night, their dark wings outlined against a sea of flame. We've seen clues about John being a king several times before, with the idea being that if John is Rhaegar's son, then he is royalty in some form or another. This isn't about John versus Danny in the line of succession, mind you, merely about his royal lineage in a general sense. So when Val says Mel sees kings and dragons in her fire, I think Martin is really talking about Jon Snow, a king and a dragon. We've already seen what was in Mel's fire vision, both dragons and Jon Snow. But the only other king that she could have seen in her fire would be Stannis, who was conspicuously absent. In other words, Jon is the only possible king that she saw. Ergo, if Mel is seeing kings and dragons in her fire, I think it can only be the potential dragon king, or perhaps ice dragon king, John Snogarian. You'll recall the talk of staring into the fire with John and Tyrion in the scene where Tyrion talks about his dragon dreams, and here these two ideas come up again side by side. The fire is where you have to look if you want to see dragons or dragon kings, apparently. The language here of John almost being able to see the dragons is very close to the description that we get when someone who has seen dragons remembers her dragon. This one isn't conclusive, so I don't want to make too much of it, but the experience John has here is interesting. Someone mentions dragons, and then for a moment, John can almost see them. If this were the only evidence that John is a Targaryen, it would be pretty weak. But since we know that's far from the case, I think Martin may well be feeding us a clue here about old Johnny Boy. Anyway, the point is that John's almost seeing of the dragons sounds a lot like what happens when Danny thinks of her missing Drogon, a dragon which she's seen many times and which she has a psychic connection to. This is Danny's inner monologue from A Dance with Dragons. And the dragons, what am I to do with them? Drogon, she whispered softly, where are you? For a moment she could almost see him sweeping across the sky, his black wings swallowing the stars. It makes sense that she can picture Drogon in her mind because she's seen him many times, and again, she has a psychic connection to him. But what dragon is John almost seeing? I'm not sure exactly what Martin is intending with this passage, but it may be a little dragon dreamlet to clue us into the idea that John is a dragon person, just as the scene with Tyrion talking about his dragon dreams and then telling John he's had the same type of dreams might be a sly wink at the idea of John having dragon dreams. What's funny to me is that the John Targaryen or John Snowgarian theory has gained much more traction and widespread acceptance than the Tyrion Targaryen theory, but in a way, the clues are actually stronger for Tyrion with his flagrant and repeated dragon dreams. Remember, we heard about Tyrion having dragon dreams all the way back in the first half of Book 1, and George continues to feed us clues pointing in that direction all the way through a dance with dragons in the world of ice and fire. Logistically, we may have more evidence for R plus L equals J than A plus J equals T, but I'll leave that sort of thing for others to hash out. When people start up the whole debate about 
who was where during Robert's rebellion, I have to confess, I quickly collapsed into a coma-like state of boredom and a puddle of my own drool. I don't believe that's how the mysteries of the books are really meant to be solved myself. I tend to prefer analysis of the narrative themes and, of course, the symbolism, as you all know, and to me, those things scream out, Tyrion of House Targaryen. And yes, I know he'd actually be Tyrion Hill by the inheritance laws of Westeros, but again, let's not get too technical. He's a dragon spawn. that's the important thing. If his lineage comes into play, it will be the magical ramifications of that lineage that matter, I think. His ability to ride a dragon, in other words, not a tangential claim to the throne. I believe it's the same with John. The point of R plus L equals J is a magical lineage, not a claim to the throne. Your own personal Mithras Reach out and touch flame <laughs> John is in a Song of Ice and Fire avatar of Mithras, as we've discussed extensively, and as was laid out in Schmendrick's legendary R plus L equals Lightbringer essay, which I like to talk about now and again, and which I also consider supplemental reading for these essays. And wouldn't you know it, Tyrion has his own legend of a rock-born hero who wields the fiery weapon of a dragon, and that's the Chinese monkey demon king, Shang Wukong. I discovered this by doing a little research on one of Tyrion's more interesting nicknames, Twisted Little Monkey Demon. Apologies for the long quote here, but I simply cannot resist crazy street prophets talking about the red comet and writhing, biting snakes. The sound of some hubbub in the street intruded on his worries. Tyrion peered out cautiously between the curtains. They were passing through Cobbler Square, where a sizable crowd had gathered beneath the leather awnings to listen to the rantings of a prophet. A robe of undyed wool, belted with a hempen rope, marked him for one of the begging brothers. Corruption! The man cried shrilly. There is the warning! Behold the father's scourge! He pointed at the fuzzy red wound in the sky. From this vantage, the distant castle on Aegon's high hill was directly behind him, with the comet hanging forebodingly over its towers. A clever choice of stage, Tyrion reflected. We have become swollen, bloated, foul! Brother couples with sister in the bed of kings, and the fruit of their incest capers in his palace to the piping of a twisted little monkey demon! High-born ladies fornicate with fools and give birth to monsters. Even the high septon has forgotten the gods. He bathes in scented waters and grows fat on lark and lamprey while his people starve. Pride comes before prayer. Maggots rule our castles and gold is all. But no more. The rotten summer is at an end, and the whoremonger king is brought low. When the boar did open him, a great stench rose to heaven, and a thousand snakes slid forth from his belly, hissing and biting. He jabbed his bony finger back at the comet and castle. There comes the harbinger. Cleanse yourselves, the gods cry out, lest ye be cleansed. Bathe in the wine of righteousness, or you shall be bathed in fire. Fire! 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 Other voices echoed, but the hoots of derision almost drowned them out. Tyrion took solace from that. He gave the command to continue, and the litter rocked like a ship on a rough sea as the burned men cleared a path. Twisted little monkey demon indeed. We'll get to the monkey demon thing in a second. But first, a wee bit of mythical astronomy, because this paragraph is loaded, and I just can't skip on past it. To begin with, take notice of the thousand snakes pouring forth from Robert's belly, which was opened by the black devil of a boar. Robert, with his antlered helm, seems to be playing the role of a sacrificed moon here, just as the antlered Renly does when his throat is cut by the shadow sword of Stannis's shadow baby assassin. The stag and the bull are both horned animals, and both can be associated with the moon, particularly the horned moon, in real-world mythology as well as Martin's own. Robert's death unleashes biting snakes and Renly's a dark tide of blood, both very recognizable symbols of the disasters which came from the second moon. Think of Sansa's hairnet of poisonous purple snakes, also representative of the moon dragons, 
and all the examples of the black and bloody tide which we've examined in the past episodes. In turn, the weapons which sliced open our sacrificial stag men, the shadow sword and the tusk of the black devil boar, both represent Lightbringer, a.k.a. the Red Comet, and here we see the comet prominently featured in the scene behind the Mad Prophet. It's even specifically compared to a wound, which seems like a clue to associate the bleeding star and Robert's sliced-open belly which pours forth the biting snakes. You'll notice the idea of the stench rising to heaven when Robert is sliced open. This is referring to the idea that the moon-breaking was in fact an abomination, as was Lightbringer. The stench that rose to heaven would have been the column of smoke and ash that quite literally rises to the sky and blots out the sun and stars. The sun and moon and stars are in turn regarded as gods by many people in A Song of Ice and Fire and the real world, and so we can see that the stench did indeed rise to the heavens, and a bath of fire did indeed follow after. The idea of a cleansing fire has parallels to Danny's dragon dream and alchemical wedding experience, as well as the idea of the blood tide from Mithras's white bull cleansing and renewing the earth. The stealing of heavenly knowledge, the forging of Lightbringer, was the abomination, and the resulting fallout of fire and blood was the cleansing agent, destroying and punishing like the Lion of Night, but also wiping the slate clean to start anew. Finally, the idea of Tyrion being served and attended by the burned men from the Mountains of the Moon is entirely in keeping with him as an Azor Ahai reborn figure, Zora High wakes dragons from stone, and we've interpreted those woken dragons as the storm of moon meteors, with the Zora High reborn himself being the transformed red comet, at least from a certain perspective. The high profile Azora High reborn figures follow this pattern, with a legion of fiery servants of some kind to attend them. Daenerys, the last dragon, represents Azora High reborn as the red comet, and she's served by her dragon children, who represent the firestorm of moon dragon meteors. John is another Azor Ahai reborn figure, and when he dreams of wielding the burning red sword, he's attended by the burning Scarecrow brothers, fiery black-blooded crows that tumble down like meteors. Tyrion is a reborn red comet, a dragon spawn, and he's attended by burned moon men that come from the moon mountains, as well as other clans with names like Moon Brothers, Stone Crows, and a few others. Tyrion's burned moon men, Danny's fire-made flesh dragons, and John's fiery, black-blooded crows. All the same idea. They all represent the dragons woken by Azor Ahai's rebirth. And now we come to the crux of this section. Tyrion is a twisted monkey demon. This cute little nickname is hung on Tyrion four different times in A Clash of Kings, so we can be sure that it's no idle turn of phrase. Besides being called a monkey demon, Tyrion is separately associated with both monkeys and demons. We'll begin with this quote from A Dance with Dragons. That night at supper, Tyrion surprised his sire by walking the length of the table on his hands. Lord Tywin was not pleased. The gods made you a dwarf. Must you be a fool as well? You were born a lion, not a monkey. And you're a corpse, father, so I'll caper as I please. Both of Azor High Reborn's parents are corpses. A dead sun and a dead moon. That's the idea. But yeah, Tyrion is a monkey, and he'll caper as he pleases. Tyrion's monkeyhood comes up again in the same book when Illyrio has to make up a false name for Tyrion on the fly. Illyrio spoke up quickly. Yalo, he was called. Yalo? Yalo sounds like something you might name a monkey. And then again in dance, when Tyrion is playing Cybast with young Griff, a.k.a. Fagon Blackfire. The dwarf pushed his black dragon across a range of mountains. But what do I know? Your false father is a great lord, and I am just some twisted little monkey man. That's pretty nice, the black dragon reference right next to the Tyrion as a monkey reference. There's actually two more quotes in dance which refer to Tyrion as a monkey. A pity. I once had a monkey who could perform all sorts of clever tricks. Your dwarf reminds me of him. Is he a gift? And then later, when he's referred to as one of Yezin's pets, You know who I am. Yolo, one of our lord's treasures. Now do as I told you. The soldiers laughed. Go on, Scar. One mocked. And be quick about it. Yezin's monkey gave you a command. Cersei also has nightmares of Tyrion, in which he is twice referred to as a monkey or as being monkey-like. 
So, I think it's pretty clear. Tyrion is a monkey. He's also a demon, and not only in those four twisted monkey demon quotes. First of all, an imp can be thought of as a type of goblin or sometimes a demon. More of a mischievous demon than an evil one, but there it is. Recall also that Nyssa means helpful elf or mischievous elf in Scandinavian languages, and that fits with Tyrion being an imp that comes from the moon, since Nyssa Nyssa is the archetypal moon maiden. Then we have this quote from A Clash of Kings. Oh, it suggested demon's head for a helm, crowned with tall golden horns. When you ride into battle, men will shrink away in fear. A demon's head. Now what does that save me? Tyrion thought ruefully. Master Solorian, I plan to fight the rest of my battles from this chair. It's lynx I need, not demon horns. What does it say of you? Well, it says you're in fact a monkey demon, Tyrion. A monkey demon who rides dragons and wears magic armor in his palace in Valyria while having vivid dreams of dragons and patricide. It's worth noting that Tyrion fought the Battle of the Blackwater Bay, which he's preparing for in this scene, by unleashing the pyromancer's wildfire, which is called the Jade Demon. We'll actually get to that scene a bit later on. Martin has also drawn general associations between monkeys and demons, such as in this quote from a Victorian chapter of A Dance with Dragons. The monkeys, though. The monkeys were a plague. Victorian had forbidden his men to bring any of the demonic creatures aboard his ship, yet somehow half his fleet was now infested with them, even his own iron victory. Might this foreshadow a conflict between Tyrion the monkey demon and Victorian? It would make a lot of sense, since Tyrion might soon be in a position to advise Daenerys, and since a good advisor would probably suggest steering clear of the ironborn. In any case, monkeys are demonic, it seems. So one day I asked myself, what's the deal with this whole monkey demon thing anyways? I wondered if there might be some mythological inspiration out there somewhere, and so I did what every great researcher does. I typed monkey demon mythology into the Google box. There was one prominent result, and that's Sheng Wukong of Chinese myth. And I'll also note that he has parallel incarnations and other related mythologies from that region of the world. He's a monkey demon king born from a rock whose eyes shine like beams of light and who wields a fiery spear that he stole from a dragon as well as magic armor that he also stole from a dragon. I kid you not, this is a real thing and it existed long before George R.R. Martin did. To get more specific, I'll be drawing from one of the four major novels of Chinese history published during the Ming Dynasty all the way back in 1592 whose title is translated as Journey to the West, and which is often simply called Monkey, because the stone monkey demon king, Sheng Wukong, is the central character. It's attributed to a fellow named Wu Cheng An, and I'll be pulling from a translation done by W.J.F. Jenner. Although I did first learn about Sheng Wukong using Google, I've now read most of this novel to gain a better understanding of his character and deeds. It's a terrific read, the battle scenes are quite epic, and the whole thing is packed with mythical astronomy. Most of the main characters are tied to stars, planets, and constellations in vivid fashion. For a great six-minute synopsis of Journey to the West, I recommend a great YouTube video by a couple of guys known as Off the Great Wall, who do fun retellings of Chinese myths and folklore. And the link for that is on my WordPress page, or you can easily look them up on YouTube. In any case, here's the deal. Sheng Wukong was born from a magic stone, which sits atop something called the Mountain of Flowers and Fruit. The magic stone develops a magic womb which, after thousands of years of absorbing the essence of the sun and the moon, stop me if this sounds familiar, bursts open to reveal a stone egg. Then the wind comes along and blows on the egg, causing it to turn into a stone monkey. Upon waking, two golden beams of light shoot out of his eyes and startle someone called the Jade Emperor. Again, this is not a song of ice and fire, but ancient Chinese mythology, and as we can see, George has borrowed from it quite a bit. The Jade Emperor is one of the rulers of the Great Empire of the Dawn, for example, and both the Great Empire of the Dawn and the Golden Empire of Yi Ti, which followed after, seem to be based loosely on Far Eastern culture and mythology. Obviously, a stone demon animal, waking from a stone egg, sets off a few buzzers and sirens, and the magic rock reminds us of the pale stone of magical powers from which the sword Dawn was made, as well as the evil black stone that the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped and which I believe was the source of the metal for Lightbringer. Lightbringer is a dragon sword, and it was hatched from a magic stone, 
just as Drogon hatched from a stone egg. Even though Sheng Wukong is a demon monkey, he's called heavenborn because he was born at the top of a mountain, which the Chinese equated with the heavens. This is a symbolic association shared by many cultures throughout the world, and it's one George has carried over into A Song of Ice and Fire. You've heard me say that a few times, but it's important and bears repeating. Anything that happens at the top of a tower or mountain, pay close attention and think about the celestial realm. As for those fiery eyes which shoot golden beams of light, the Lannisters are also noted for their luminous green and gold eyes, and of course we've seen the wider phenomenon of fiery eyes with people and animals who symbolize moon meteors. Elsewhere in the novel, it's said of Sheng Wukong that his devil eyes shone like stars. Surely the equivalency between eyes and stars can be found all over the place in world mythology, but my point here is that Sheng Wukong is a convenient fit for George's world building because of his various attributes. Sheng Wukong's fiery eyes can also see through illusion. He's constantly exposing body snatching demons posing as normal people and destroying them. Tyrion doesn't spot any changelings, but he is very perceptive in King's Landing, and he uses elaborate bruises and misdirection to sniff out Cersei's informant, which turns out to be Pycelle. Now, it could be coincidence, or it could be an echo of Sheng Wukong's magical perception. There's more. Sheng Wukong can change his form into that of any other creature, a shape-shifting ability somewhat akin to skin-changing. That doesn't really have anything to do with Tyrion, but it might have something to do with the original Azor Ahai being a skin-changer or green seer, just as Azor Ahai figure Jon Snow is a skin-changer and soon-to-be-resurrected skin-changer. Sheng Wukong simply loves to steal weapons. He's basically obsessed with it. He travels to the bottom of the ocean and defeats a dragon king of the eastern seas, taking from him a glowing iron staff which turns out to be Sheng Wukong's most identifiable and well-known weapon. This staff is really something. It's made of black iron and banded in gold, a terrific lightbringer weapon, you must admit. Even better, Sheng Wukong's gold-banded dragon staff can multiply into a thousand flying staffs, which are described as being like filling the sky with dragons. This amazing staff is actually depicted as the pillar of the heavens and the Milky Way, which keeps the seas calm. That's the same pillar of the universe role played by Yggdrasil and other mythological world trees, or sometimes by an omphalos or navel stone. The mythological phenomena of representing the celestial axis with symbols is called the Axis Mundi, by the way. Sun Wukong's possession of this staff makes him the master of the heavens. Similarly, he takes on titles like the Great Sage and the Great Sage who equals heaven. It also gives him great potential for mischief, which is what monkeys are known for. Sheng Wukong then went on to defeat the dragons of the Four Seas and take from them a golden chainmail shirt, a purple and gold phoenix-winged helmet, and cloud-walking boots. Pretty sweet haul, right? Basically, if there's a sea dragon anywhere out there in the wide world who has magical weapons or armor, Sheng Wukong tracks them down and takes their stuff. The end result is that Sheng Wukong is a rock-born demon king who is decked out in fiery black and gold dragon weapons and black and gold dragon armor. He's a child of the sun and the moon, and he can fill the air with a thousand dragons. And we are just getting started. As a quick aside, notice that dragons in Chinese myth tend to be associated with water, as I've pointed out before, and I believe this stems from experiences with violent tsunamis triggered by comet and meteor impacts in the Pacific Ocean. This idea is paralleled in the Ironborn legend of the sea dragon Naga, which drowns whole islands in her wrath. One of the major defining themes of Sheng Wukong's character is that he challenges the heavens and rebels against the gods, and even against the very order of nature itself. He defies Hell's attempt to collect his soul, barging into Hell and dramatically wiping his name from the book of life and death, along with those of his monkey hordes, breaking the reincarnation cycle. He's literally said to have broken the balance between yin and yang, between light and dark, day and night, male and female. Check out this passage from A Journey to the West, a plea to the Jade Emperor by a concerned Bodhisattva. The regions of darkness are the negative part of the earth. Heaven contains gods, while the earth has devils. Positive and negative are in a constant cycle. Birds and beasts are born and die. Male and female alternate. 
Life is created and change takes place. Male and female are conceived and born. This is the order of nature and it cannot be changed. Now the evil spirit, the heaven-born monkey of the water curtain cave, on the mountain of flowers and fruit, is presently giving full reign to his wicked nature, committing murders and refusing to submit to discipline. He killed the devil messenger of the ninth hell with his magic, and he terrified the ten benevolent kings of the underworld with his power. He made an uproar in the Sen Luo palace and crossed some names out by force. He has made the race of monkeys completely uncontrollable and given eternal life to the macaques. He has annulled the law of transmigration and brought them beyond birth and death. I, impoverished monk that I am, importune the might of heaven by presenting this memorial. I prostrate myself to beg that heavenly soldiers be dispatched to subdue this fiend, bring the positive and negative back into order, and give lasting security to the underworld. That's the very essence of what the long night is about, breaking the cycle of the seasons and of life and death. The gods are of course very disturbed at Sheng Wukong's actions, and so they decide to invite Sheng Wukong to heaven as a ploy to fool him into thinking he's being honored, but the real goal is to try to control him. This backfires as Sheng Wukong sees through their scheme and steals a bunch of really cool stuff from heaven, like the peaches of immortality and the royal wine of the gods, and then returns to earth. For this, he is called the Wrecker of the Heavenly Palace. Sheng Wukong is pretty much on a lifelong quest to gain immortality, which he actually does several times over, stealing the peaches here and crossing his name from Death's Book previously. All of this fits very nicely with the themes of the Azor Ahai story, challenging the gods and stealing fire from heaven, breaking the cycles of life and nature and seeking to escape death and live forever. Tyrion himself challenges, defies, and eventually kills his own father, in violation of the most sacred laws of the gods. An egg learned to be a man, cultivated his conduct and achieved the way. Heaven had been undisturbed for the thousand kalpas, until one day the spirits and gods were scattered. The rebel against heaven, wanting high position, insulted immortals, stole the pills, and destroyed morality. Sheng Wukong goes on to seriously whoop ass against the army of heaven, who are depicted as star warriors, defeating 100,000 of them single-handedly. He doesn't just defeat them, he makes a mockery of them. In fact, that's a major part of Sheng Wukong's character, and this is a very good match for Tyrion. He basically talks shit to everyone, without exception. Sheng Wukong is even described as impish in the Chinese epic novel, or at least in the English translation of it. Basically, Sheng Wukong talks a big game and then backs it up, destroying or driving off everyone that the Jade Emperor can throw at him with his unbeatable black fire staff and various other tricks and weapons and magics. Eventually, however, and not without great effort, Sheng Wukong is captured by a pair of immortal warriors and placed in some kind of sacred crucible to be incinerated. But after 49 days of burning, the crucible is opened and out pops Sheng Wukong, stronger than ever, and now armed with fiery, enhanced magical sight. In other words, Sheng Wukong was forged like a sword and reborn in sacred fire. That's an amazingly tight correlation to the wording of the Lightbringer myth, and to Danny's experiences of being forged like a sword and reborn in fire, and more generally to the idea of a flying meteor sword that was born from a burning moon rock. As for Tyrion, there may be a humorous echo of this story in A Dance with Dragons, when he was trapped inside a wine barrel on his voyage across the Narrow Sea. Not exactly a crucible, but it is a very small box that he was locked in for an extended period of time. Instead of emerging more powerful, he emerged more drunk. But hey, you have to change a few details to make things work for the scene, right? The Jade Emperor then appeals to the Buddha, who contrives to trap Sun Wukong in his enormous fist and then seal him under a mountain for five centuries although Sheng Wukong is eventually set free later in the novel and earns honors for himself by protecting the main hero of the second part of the story, and he is even granted Buddhahood for his service and strength. You'll notice that the idea of Sheng Wukong being stuck inside a fist and inside a mountain, or being born from the top of a mountain, are very reminiscent of George's fiery hand and riding mountain symbolic motifs that we examined in the last podcast. The moon turning into things is what Azor Ahai's rebirth is all about, and several of these symbols appear in Sun Wukong's story. Stone demons, fiery dragon spears, 
huge mountains, and divine fists. You can see why George wove this into his Azor High tapestry of ideas. It's a natural fit. Personally, I think it would have been funny if George had decided to have Melisandre spend a bunch of time talking about waking monkeys from stone instead of waking dragons from stone. But hey, artistic freedom and all. This brings up another potential Tyrion connection. Sheng Wukong is from the Mountain of Fruit and Flowers, which is in the east. It's from atop this mountain that the heaven-born monkey king's stone egg hatched. On this mountain lives the monkey army of Sheng Wukong. Could this be a parallel to the great mountains of the Vale of Arryn, in the east, from which Tyrion gains his mountain clan army? The Vale is known for its fecundity, and although Tyrion wasn't born there, he was almost thrown from atop the mountain via the moon door, which would be like Sheng Wukong being born from the top of a mountain. Saving the best Sheng Wukong correlations for last, it seems that one of the many weapons and magics he can employ is to summon up a storm, which sounds a lot like the Long Night, quite frankly. This is Sheng Wukong trying to break into a great city to steal even more magic weapons. The guy can't get enough weapons, it seems. Actually, in this scene, Sheng Wukong is specifically trying to steal weapons to arm his monkey hordes, which reminds us of Tyrion obtaining weapons to arm the mountain clans. So he made a magic with his fist and said the words of the spell, sucked in some air from the southeast and blew it hard out again. It turned into a terrifying gale carrying sand and stones with it. Where the thunderclouds rise, the elements are in chaos. Black fogs thick with dust cloak the earth in darkness. Boiling rivers and seas terrify the crabs and fish. As trees are snapped off in mountain forests, Tigers and wolves flee. The thrones of princes are all blown over. Towers of five phoenixes are shaken to their foundations. And then this similar line. A gusty sandstorm blotted out the heavens. Purple fog threw the earth into darkness. Just because the monkey fiend defended the supreme emperor, heavenly hosts were sent down to the mortal dust. Sheng Wukong can summon the Long Night, apparently. That's pretty potent. I'm not sure why you'd need more weapons if you could do that. In any case, I'm making the claim that Sheng Wukong plays into the myth of Azor Ahai Reborn, and also that Azor Ahai caused the Long Night. So, it's pretty sweet to see that Sheng Wukong carries the Long Night in his back pocket. On a different occasion, Sheng Wukong is battling the Demon King of the North, who fights with a shining sword, a helmet of dark gold, and black steel armor, it should be noted, and Sheng Wukong actually threatens to pull down the moon with his two hands and bash the Demon King with it. I kid you not. The Long Night parallels continue in another line, where Sheng Wukong is called a hairy-faced thunder god. And don't forget, he pulled out the pillar of the Milky Way and carries it about with him, giving him true dominion over the heavens and the earth. This also gives him the ability to disrupt the cycles of nature, block out the sun, pull down the moon, shake the world to its foundations, fill the air with flying dragons, and destroy the star army of heaven. In addition to the parallels with Tyrion's story, you can see that the basic elements of the Sheng Wukong myth are also very analogous to that of Mithras and Azor Ahai, and that's not a coincidence. Here's what I think is going on. Essentially, at some point early in the writing process, Martin must have decided he wanted to create a central fable for his world involving a flaming sword, dragons, comets, and resurrection. At this point, I believe Martin began collecting all the interesting myths of flaming swords, comets, dragons, and resurrection. Best of all, stories which contained more than one of these elements. Then, he uses these various myths as starting points for different characters in the story, particularly the major characters which manifest as Zora High Reborn symbolism. Let's very briefly run through a few flaming sword myths, and there is a song of ice and fire correlation so you can see what I mean. The Azor Ahai myth, as a whole, draws heavily from Mithras, of course, and of all the various Azor Ahai reborn manifestations, Jon Snow in particular is often a specific avatar of Mithras. Tyrion seems to draw many things from Sheng Wukong, the monkey demon king with the fiery spear. In Norse mythology, there is a devil giant named Suter, which means black or swarthy in Old Norse, who wields a shining sword that eventually brings forth flames that engulf the entire world. 
I'm sure you can see the clear parallels to Azora High there, and possibly to Jon Snow, who dresses in armors in black, but dreams of wielding a burning sword. And also to Daenerys, who is poised to engulf large parts of the world in blood and fire, and whose dragons are like a flaming sword above the world. Tyrion, besides being a demon, is also a giant on many occasions, so perhaps he's channeling a bit of suture as well. Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, and his alive with light sword Dawn, borrows quite a bit from King Arthur's glowing sword, Excalibur. Excalibur was a sword which shone so bright at times that it actually blinded his enemies. A real lightbringer, you might say. In some tales, Excalibur is the same as the sword Arthur pulled from the stone, which might have been a part of the basis for the idea of Dawn being made from a magical stone. In other versions, the sword pulled from the stone is eventually broken and replaced by Excalibur, which reminds us quite sharply of the last hero and the idea that he broke his sword and later ended up slaying others with something remembered as dragon steel. There's actually a ton of Arthurian references in A Song of Ice and Fire, as Lady Gwyn of Radio Westeros can tell you, but let's keep moving for now. I've even mentioned the old Hanna-Barbera cartoon, Thundar, as a potential influence on the Azor High Long Night mythos, because good old Thundar the Barbarian has a sun sword, which is basically something like a lightsaber, and the backstory of the show is a red comet streaking in between the Earth and the Moon and causing such environmental disaster that the modern technical world is thrown back into a medieval swords and sorcery environment. Sounds familiar, right? Well... George is hugely into cartoons and comics, and Thundar came out way back in 1984, so don't doubt for a second that he might get an idea from a show like Thundar. If you do doubt me in any way, just look up the intro to the Thundar show on YouTube and prepare to lose your mind a little. It's like the events of The Long Night animated by Hanna-Barbera. In summary, my hypothesis is that George decided he wanted to write about flaming swords, and so he looked for all the cool flaming sword myths he could find and worked them in wherever it made sense. Shang Wukong works so nicely for Tyrion because Shang Wukong's story shares so many elements with Mithras, and the idea of Tyrion as a monkey makes a lot of sense with his character and stature. It's his own personal Mithras. The conclusion I draw from all this Shang Wukong stuff besides, wow, that's pretty cool that George is into Chinese mythology, is that Tyrion gets his own rock-born, flaming weapon-wielding mythological forefather because he is one of the three heads of the dragon, and a secret Targaryen. We've seen many characters who are definitely not Targaryens play the role of Azor High Reborn, but none with the kind of extensive correlations to myths of warriors with flaming weapons which we find in Tyrion, Jon Snow, and Daenerys, with one notable exception. As for that exception... It's Arthur Dane and his Arthurian symbolism, and he's definitely not a Targaryen. However, I have proposed in an older essay that the occasionally purple-eyed and silver-haired Danes have a common ancestor with Valyria, the vanished Great Empire of the Dawn, and specifically the purple-eyed Amethyst Empress. Also, the Sword of the Morning archetype seems to be the light half of the Lightbringer Yin and Yang, with the Zor High's black sword being the dark side, naturally, and so it makes sense to see extensive manifestation of a well-known flaming sword myth like that of King Arthur and Excalibur in the person of Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. There can be little doubt that Dawn and House Dane have something to do with the Lightbringer legend, no matter how you see the details shaking out. And while we're talking about yin and yang, I neglected to point out previously in our essay about the Bloodstone Emperor that yin is the dark side of yin and yang, and one of the names of Azor Ahai is... Yin Tar. If you wanted a clue that Azor High and Lightbringer are from the dark side, then there you go. They are literally the force of Yin. I think that's a pretty clever tip off there. Now, as for Tyrion as a manifestation of Azor High Reborn, there are a couple of other details about him which fit with the Azor High archetype. Like Mithras and Sun Wukong, he was born from a rock, Casterly Rock, that is. That's the rock in whose bowels he sits while lighting fires and dreaming of dragons. His mother died at his birth, which is a standard for any real Azor High reborn player. The moon dying at Azor High's rebirth is kind of the central event to this whole drama, after all. John and Danny's mothers both die in conjunction with giving birth, and Joanna Lannister does the same. We've seen Azor High Reborn depicted as a monster in the case of dead lizard baby Rego, as well as a dragon which came to life with human sacrifice. 
and there may be a nod to this in the form of the monstrous rumors about Tyrion's birth, which Oberyn repeats to him right before his fight with the mountain. He tells Tyrion that he heard that Tyrion had been born with a tail, and a monstrously large head, thick black hair, an evil eye, lion's claws, and teeth so large he couldn't close his mouth. Azor Ahai's rebirth heralded the fall of the Long Night. This is one of my biggest claims in all of my research, and there's a clue about this in that same scene with Oberyn and Tyrion. Oberyn continues on to say that Tyrion's birth was a curse for Tywin, the son, and an ill omen for the realm, to which Tyrion quips, Famine, plague, and war, no doubt. It's always famine, plague, and war. Oh, and winter, and the long night that never ends. George is telling us the truth about Tyrion and Azor High in plain language, but he's hiding it with sarcasm. Oh yes, his birth heralded the long night. He's got magic armor and a palace in Valyria, I roll, I roll. He must be some sort of lost Targaryen prince, chuckle, chuckle, wink, wink. Say no more, George. Say no more. To sum up all of that, we have seen that Mr. Martin based large parts of his Lightbringer legend on Mithras, and that he chose to manifest those elements in Jon's Ark specifically. Having already conceived of the character of Tyrion as a Targaryen early on, and one of the three heads of the dragon, he must have seen the Sheng Wukong figure as a kind of personal Mithras-type myth for Tyrion's character. Sheng Wukong is basically the monkey version of Azor Ahai, and that's more or less what George has done with Tyrion's character by making him a monkey demon dragon spawn. Consider also that Sheng Wukong is basically a chaos agent who has the potential to tip the balance of world events, and I think that's exactly the kind of role Tyrion is shaping up to play. He had a dramatic effect on young Jon Snow. He took many momentous actions at King's Landing. He had a dramatic effect on young Griff's course of action. And soon, he'll be in a position to have an effect on the Mother of Dragons. Dragons old and young, true and false, bright and dark. And you, a small man with a big shadow, snarling in the midst of all. Perfectly round, gleaming bright, how can men learn to live forever? He can enter fire without being burned, and go into the water but not be drowned. He is as bright as a many pearl, swords and spears cannot harm him. He is capable of good, and capable of evil. When faced with the choice between good and evil, he might do either. If he is good, he becomes a Buddha or an immortal. If bad, he grows fur and horns. With his boundless transformations, he wrecked the heavenly palace. Nor can thunder generals or divine troops take him. Today, his terrible sins are being punished. Who knows when he will be able to rise again? Your friendly neighborhood gargoyle. Now it's time to talk about gargoyles, which is something Tyrion is associated with all throughout the series, as many of you may recall. The second half of this episode will primarily deal with the connection between Tyrion and gargoyles and its implications for the story, but interwoven throughout will be talk of Winterfell, Bran, and the Last Hero. It turns out to be impossible to talk about Tyrion the Gargoyle without bringing up Winterfell, Bran, and the Last Hero, so that's what we'll do. For example, the first place that we see Tyrion described as a gargoyle is Winterfell, and Winterfell is in turn famously decorated with gargoyles. Gargoyles feature prominently in Bran's early story arc in A Game of Thrones, particularly his fall from the tower, and in turn, Tyrion the Gargoyle is connected to Bran by the saddle he designed for him after his accident, and by Caitlin's fateful decision to accuse Tyrion of attempting to murder Bran, which basically shapes the entire sad story of A Game of Thrones. And as you guys know, I can never resist a little last hero talk when it's there to be had. And it's there to be had. The first mention of gargoyles in A Song of Ice and Fire comes at Winterfell, but refers not to the actual gargoyles perched on the walls of the keep, but to Tyrion Lannister perched on the walls of the keep. The sounds of music and song spilled through the open windows behind him. 
They were the last thing John wanted to hear. He wiped away his tears on the sleeve of his shirt, furious that he had let them fall, and turned to go. Boy! A voice called out to him. John turned. Tyrion Lannister was sitting on the ledge above the door to the Great Hall, looking for all the world like a gargoyle. The dwarf grinned down at him. Twenty-three pages later, we start hearing about gargoyles on the tops of buildings at Winterfell, and by this time, we've most likely forgotten about Tyrion being called a gargoyle as he perched atop a building at Winterfell. But I would suggest that there's a deliberate connection being drawn. Tyrion is called a gargoyle many, many times in the series, and I believe the reason is this. Gargoyles are flying stone beasts associated with hell and dragons, both in the real world and in A Song of Ice and Fire. The term gargoyle generally refers to any grotesque stone creature which adorns the roof of a building, and they come in all different forms. In fact, the same thing is said of gargoyles that is said of snowflakes. No two are alike. There are several variations on the story of how the first gargoyle came to be, but they all involve a fellow named St. Romanus capturing and burning a dragon. The head and the neck of the dragon, having been hardened by years of breathing fire, would not burn, and so St. Romanus mounted the head and the neck of the dragon on the walls of the newly built church to scare off evil spirits. Although gargoyles come in many forms, they are first and foremost stone dragons. Most legends of gargoyles involve them waking in the night and flying around, so you've got the dragons waking from stone idea present in the mythos of the gargoyle as well. Calling Tyrion a gargoyle is very close to naming him a dragon, and at the very least, it's naming him a hell beast which wakes from stone, just like the demon monkey king, Shang Wukong. In other words, both of Tyrion's nicknames point towards hellish demons waking from stone and dragons. Both of them point to Tyrion Targaryen. A nice touch on Tyrion's gargoyle association is the fact that gargoyle statues often have chains around their neck, which reminds us of Tyrion's famous chain which saved King's Landing. As for the gargoyles of Winterfell, they are so worn that you cannot make out their shape anymore, but the truth about them is revealed when they are seen in dream form by Bran. This is from A Game of Thrones. In his dream he was climbing again, pulling himself up an ancient windowless tower, his fingers forcing themselves between blackened stones, his feet scrabbling for purchase. Higher and higher he climbed, through the clouds and into the night sky, and still the tower rose before him. When he paused to look down, his head swam dizzily, and he felt his fingers slipping. Bran cried out and clung for dear life. The earth was a thousand miles beneath him, and he could not fly. He could not fly. He waited until his heart had stopped pounding, until he could breathe, and he began to climb again. There was no way to go but up. Far above him, outlined against a vast pale moon, he thought he could see the shapes of gargoyles. His arms were sore and aching, but he dared not rest. He forced himself to climb faster. The gargoyles watched him ascend. Their eyes glowed red as hot coals in a brazier. Perhaps once they had been lions, but now they were twisted and grotesque. Bran could hear them whispering to each other in soft, stone voices, terrible to hear. He must not listen, he told himself. He must not hear. So long as he did not hear them, he was safe. But when the gargoyles pulled themselves loose from the stone and padded down the side of the tower to where Bran clung, he knew he was not safe after all. I didn't hear, he wept as they came closer and closer. I didn't. I didn't. He woke gasping lost in darkness, and saw a vast shadow looming over him. I didn't hear, he whispered, trembling in fear. But then the shadow said, Hodor, and lit the candle by the bedside, and Bran sighed with relief. This dream occurs immediately after Tyrion returns to Winterfell on his way back from the wall, and offers up the design for a saddle that will enable the crippled Bran to ride horses. This is done, perhaps, to put us in mind of Tyrion the gargoyle, right before Bran's dream about fiery-eyed gargoyles. In any case, let's discuss the fiery associations of those gargoyles. They watch Bran with red eyes like hot coals, a match for the descriptions of the eyes of Melisandre, Bloodraven, Ghost, and most importantly one of the dragons, Viserion, all of whom have eyes which are described as coals at one point or another. Those gargoyles might have been lions once, 
suggesting a correlation between the gargoyles and the Lannisters. And this, of course, follows up on the labeling of Tyrion as a gargoyle earlier in the book. It's also quite suggestive of the gargoyles as an Azor Ahai reborn moon meteor symbol. Azor Ahai and his meteors used to be lions in that they represent a transformed sun, a sun which is transformed into something more twisted and monstrous. Those monstrous moon meteors drank the fire of the sun, but they also came from the moon. And indeed, when Bran sees the gargoyles, they appear superimposed over the moon, right at the top of the tower, where heavenly bodies belong. Then the gargoyles pulled themselves loose from the stone, implying detachment from the stone moon, and they descend the black tower with red eyes like hot coals. This is all just as it should be if the gargoyles are intended to represent Azor Ahai Reborn and his flying dragon meteors. There should be little doubt that this scene is one of our first examples of mythical astronomy in the books, with Bran climbing up a black tower through the clouds and into the night sky, and with the earth a thousand miles below him. That's about as clear as it gets. The moon appears at the top of the black tower, as I mentioned, introducing to us the idea that the tops of towers are equivalent to celestial bodies. And then, a fiery gargoyle comes down from the moon. That's also pretty easy to understand in terms of mythical astronomy. This falling gargoyle idea is an echo of that first scene with Tyrion as a gargoyle when he jumps down from the roof at Winterfell. Can you climb down, or shall I bring a ladder? Oh, bleed that, the little man said. He pushed himself off the ledge into empty air. John gasped, then watched with awe as Tyrion Lannister spun around in a tight ball, landed lightly on his hands, then vaulted backward onto his legs. George has said that he actually regrets depicting Tyrion as being so nimble, because for most of the rest of the series, George gives him a limp and a waddling gait. Regardless, Tyrion the gargoyle jumps down from the sky, spinning like a ball, giving us the image of a falling moon meteor, just as the gargoyle coming down from the moon in Bran's dream did. Gargoyles come down from the moon because they represent one aspect of the moon meteors. George puts the words, bleed that, into his mouth as he falls, which is the only time anyone uses that expression in the books, and I think the purpose is to create the image of a bleeding star or a bloody stone falling from the sky. And John watches with awe. Since Bran is the one who falls from the tower, it's pretty clear Bran must also be representing the moon's fall from the heavens. He's specifically pushed out of the top of a tower by a sun figure, so there's really not much wiggle room here. His head swims in that scene, which creates the image of a moon face going swimming in the ocean, the familiar moon drowning symbol. Bran weeps with fear, and of course the moon crying meteor tears is a symbol you guys are well familiar with. Then he wakes lost in darkness, just as Azor Ahai Reborn wakes lost in the darkness of the long night. As always, the various incarnations of the moon meteors all tell us different things about Azor Ahai Reborn and Lightbringer. It may seem weird that Bran and the gargoyles are representing the same thing, but we can learn different lessons from each. We'll start with Tyrion. Generally speaking, the fiery gargoyles show us monsters coming from the moon, which is easy to understand. But I should also point out that gargoyles are pretty consistently associated with protection and warding against evil spirits. That's why you find them on the walls of churches and cathedrals. We've seen Azor Ahai Reborn sometimes depicted in this kind of role, such as with Sandor, the hellhound version of Azor Ahai Reborn, protecting and avenging moon maiden Sansa Stark, and with the idea of Oathkeeper being used to avenge and protect Ned's children. Tyrion himself also protects Sansa from Joffrey's abuse, and later plays a protective role for Penny the dwarf girl, with a gargoyle reference specifically hung on Tyrion in one of those scenes. We'll check that out in a moment, actually. Tyrion also successfully saves King's Landing from Stannis. That's quite the act of protection, and there's once again a terrific gargoyle quote right in the middle of the battle. Stannis is seen by those in King's Landing as the stranger come to judge us who serves a demon god, so in this sense, Tyrion is definitely warding King's Landing against evil. I also wouldn't be surprised to see him play a similar protective role to Daenerys. In fact, there is kind of a cryptic clue about this in the world of Ice and Fire. One story from Yi Ti about the Long Night is that a woman with a monkey's tail somehow helped to end the Long Night. A tail is also the name for the attendance of a monarch, and a monkey for a tail might be Tyrion as an advisor to a woman who might help end the new Long Night. Daenerys. In any case, the protection aspect of the gargoyle, illustrated by Tyrion, has some potentially serious implications. 
We've seen the protection theme as one aspect of Azor Ahai Reborn a few times now, as I just mentioned, and I think this almost certainly applies to the idea of Azor Ahai protecting all warm-blooded life from the others with Lightbringer. Whether that deed was performed by Azor Ahai's son, the last hero, who would have been righting the wrongs of his father, or else by a reformed Azor Ahai doing something similar to atone for his actions. At this point, I think it's an inescapable conclusion. Although Azor Ahai definitely broke the moon when he forged Lightbringer, which seems to have been the cause of the Long Night, Lightbringer and some version of Azor Ahai Reborn seems to have later fought off the Long Night and helped to return the sun to the sky. This actually makes sense when you think about it. Azor Ahai is a solar character and his fall from grace depicts the darkening of the sun. If the sun eventually comes back out to shine, as we know it did, it follows that Azor Ahai gained some level of redemption either through penitence on his own part or that of his descendant. Thus, the gargoyle actually shows us two things about Azor Ahai Reborn and Lightbringer. It's a fiery monster descending from the sky, but there is some aspect of it which can protect or avenge. So let's talk about Bran. What does Bran as a moon meteor symbol tell us? Well, I think the message has something to do with Bran becoming a green seer. Blood Raven is draped in a certain type of Azor Ahai symbolism, as we've discussed before, and he is, of course, the Greenseer of the North. We've also seen many instances of crossover between fire magic and old god Greenseer magic, Jon Snow, Beric Dondarrion, Blood Raven, the leaves of the Weirwoods being like fiery and bloody hands, and many more which we've also discussed in previous episodes. Azor Ahai broke the moon, and the Greenseer supposedly called down the Hammer of the Waters, but I've laid out a strong case that the hammer was in fact a moon meteor. Now if Azor Ahai was a green seer, or worked with green seers or their magic somehow, then both stories can contain an element of the truth, which is usually how Martin does things. I actually have a ton to say about the intersection of green seer magic and fire magic, which will be its own episode, so for now I'll have to simply say that Bran, as a reborn moon child, almost certainly plays into that idea. A bit more on Bran as an Azor Ahai reborn person. Bran's skin changes Hodor, and Hodor too gets the Azor Ahai symbols on occasion. A sword and a torch, one eye wound, etc. And he specifically gets those symbols in scenes where Bran is skin changing him. There are some great Lightbringer forging metaphors in those scenes too, particularly at Queen's Crown with all the lightning and its broken tower top, and that creepy scene at the Night Fort. Another time, another time. This can indicate that Azor Ahai might have done a bit of body snatching, which is exactly the kind of thing we should expect from him if indeed he was a green seer, as I am coming to suspect he may have been. His rebirth might have been, well, you know, a body snatching. Some people have guessed that Bran will actually skin change a dragon, and wouldn't that just be super fucking badass? I've always liked that idea, and it would totally fit with the symbolism of Bran's fall from the tower as a parallel to the hatching of the moon dragons. If Azor Ahai was some kind of dragon-riding green seer, then it makes sense for a green seer like Bran to be a kind of dragon rider. So now, read this quote from A Game of Thrones, remembering what the gargoyles represent. Bran pulled himself up, climbed over the gargoyle, crawled out onto the roof. This was the easy way. He moved across the roof to the next gargoyle, right above the window of the room where they were talking. All this talk is getting very tiresome, sister. The man said. Come here and be quiet. Bran sat astride the gargoyle, tightened his legs around it, and swung himself around, upside down. He hung by his legs and slowly stretched his head down toward the window. The world looked strange upside down. A courtyard swam dizzily below him, its stones still wet with melted snow. Bran looked in the window. Bran sat astride the gargoyle. Dun-dun-dun. Now, I'm not sure if we can interpret this as a foreshadowing of Bran riding a dragon in the future or not, because he's sitting astride the gargoyle right before the sun figure pushes him out of the tower, which is more like Bran riding a moon dragon down to a fateful impact with the earth. However, we can note that Bran is currently learning to fly, as is said many times, and he's being taught to do so by a Targaryen greenseer. Who knows? We'll just have to see what happens. As a side note, the idea of Bran hanging upside down from a dragon's belly, like some sort of expertly skilled Mongol horseman or Luke Skywalker in The Empire Strikes Back, is pretty entertaining. Come on, HBO, let's blow that CGI budget. I'm telling you, it'll be great. Okay, enough joking around. This, this is serious. Let's be serious now. I've talked about the theme of the Bloodstone Emperor Azor Ahai 
being one of stealing from heaven, of trying to climb too high. Just like the morning star is perceived to be trying to rise before the sun and steal its glory, as if it were the sun itself, the high god, only to fail and fall back down to earth. The bloodstone emperor Azora High tries to gain starry wisdom, the heavenly fire of the gods. There's an echo of this theme in Bran's scene here, as he's literally climbing a tower into the heavens, only to be pushed out of the tower because of something he knows. It's forbidden knowledge that almost cost him his life. He tries to unhear what he has heard, screaming, I didn't hear! But of course he did hear, and he does know, and this knowledge cost him a fall from the tower. Ultimately, this event resulted in a transformation. Bran dreams while in his coma, and actually seems to begin to tap into his green seer abilities before waking, when he finally learns to fly, and astrally projects himself all over Westeros and sees events that are actually occurring, albeit in somewhat symbolic fashion. This is the Azor High Reborn story, a man who reached for the stars and got burned, and then was transformed. The big question now is, how did his story end? Perhaps the most obvious and important implication of the idea of Bran as an Azor High Reborn figure is that Bran seems to be closely mimicking the arc of the last hero, and here we'll deviate for the aforementioned last hero talk. The last hero journeyed into the frozen dead lands, seeking out the children of the forest, and ended up working against the others in the long night. That's pretty much Bran's storyline so far. The last hero had a sword, which broke, and twelve companions, who died, as well as a dog and a horse, who also died. Bran himself may be the broken sword, if you want to take it that far, with a wolf for a dog and an elk for a horse. My buddy from the Westeros.org forums, known as The Last Milnabonian, has an interesting theory that Bran has met 12 people on his journey that have either died or will die as a correlation to The Last Hero's 12 dead companions. And you can find a link for that on my WordPress page, as usual. Regardless of the smaller details, Bran is definitely retracing the important footsteps of The Last Hero. Ironic metaphor alert. Bran, footsteps, nah. Bran, as a falling moon meteor figure, and a last hero figure, is also another corroboration that the last hero story is somehow connected to the idea of Azor High Reborn. Now, Bran being a last hero figure also clues us into the idea that the Starks are probably connected to the last hero as well, an idea which we already had, of course, and thus to Azor High Reborn. The mystery of how the Starks, the last hero, and the last hero's blade of dragonsteel are connected with the myth of Azor High and Lightbringer is one of the biggest mysteries in the books, in my opinion. It's the whole reason that John being half Targaryen and half Stark is significant, for one thing, and I believe it will figure into the ultimate endgame of the series. I mean, ask yourself, why all this to do about Azor High and Lightbringer, a fantastical myth from the other side of the world, in a story which is squarely centered on Westeros and the Starks? There must be some connection, right? I'm claiming Azor Ahai, also called the Bloodstone Emperor, caused the Long Night, but the most famous effect of the Long Night, besides the general darkness, was the invasion of the Others, which happened in Westeros. In order for all this Azor Ahai stuff to be relevant, there needs to be a connection to the main events in Westeros. Everyone can see that the Dragons and the Others are on some sort of collision course. People can see there's a connection, a date with destiny in other words. Many think that the solution to the ice demons might evolve heroes who are dragon-blooded people riding dragons, the three heads of the dragon, if you will. I mean, you could also look at it the other way around, pun intended, and say that the elegant ice elves are the solution to the fire monsters. But the point is, what's the connection? Because all things come round again in A Song of Ice and Fire, the same thing must have happened in the past. This would be the place where Azor High and Lightbringer connect to the last hero, Dragonsteel, and the Starks. Similarly, everyone can see the parallels between John and Danny, and that they are both the clearest manifestations of Azor High Reborn. But one is associated with fire, and the other with ice. Pun intended, once again. Lyanna herself is specifically associated with the Blue Winter Rose, and John has the Black Ice theme featured prominently in his storyline. Now let me tell you, I think the debate about which one is really Azor High Reborn is kind of silly. They're both Azor High Reborn but one is Azor Ahai Reborn in an icy sheath. The interaction between John and Danny stands to figure prominently in the conclusion of the story, however you envision that meeting going down. The question is, what happens? What is the interaction between ice and fire, between other and dragon? I have some ideas about that, actually. It's one of the big conclusions which all of my essays are building up to. 
Here's a bit of a clue about that, and it brings us back to gargoyles again. The real ones carved from stone this time, not people symbolized by gargoyles. I've actually been waiting to bring this topic up for a long time, so check this out. There are actually only two castles in all of Westeros, nay, in all of A Song of Ice and Fire, which are warded with gargoyles. And those two castles are the First Keep of Winterfell, which is the oldest part built by Brandon the Builder, and Dragonstone, the ancestral home of House Targaryen, which was built by the Valerians. That's quite a fascinating parallel, don't you think? Putting gargoyles on castle walls is nothing special. That's where you'd expect to see them, after all. And if George had randomly sprinkled them on various castles throughout the land, we wouldn't think much of it. But instead, we find them exclusively at these two extremely significant castles. This tells us much and more, I believe. The gargoyles of Dragonstone are all hell beasts of various kinds, with dragons being chief among them. The two on Crescent's balcony are a hellhound and a wyvern, for example, and of course the dragons are everywhere. The stone gargoyles and dragons are specifically used as meteor symbols in scenes on Dragonstone such as the Crescent prologue of Clash and the burning of the Seventh scene, also from Clash, where Stannis and Mel do their little Lightbringer reenactment ceremony. The gargoyles of Dragonstone themselves are made of fused black stone, stone burnt black and super hardened by dragonfire, which makes for a very clear and vivid parallel to our burning black moon meteor dragons. In that scene where they burn the seven and draw forth fake Lightbringer, the gargoyles and dragons look as though they are about to come to life, just as Winterfell's gargoyles come to life with fire in their eyes in Bran's dream. Heat rose, shimmering through the chill air, Behind, the gargoyles and stone dragons on the castle wall seem blurred, as if Davos were seeing them through a veil of tears. Or as if the beasts were trembling, stirring. This entire scene is laced with talk of waking dragons from stone, and we can see here in the second paragraph of the chapter that the idea of waking gargoyles is akin to waking dragons. They're lumped in together as stone hell beasts that might be stirring. The veil of tears is an expression which refers to the barrier between life and death, so the resurrection symbolism is really pretty thick here. Not only are the dragons and gargoyles coming to life, they're coming back from the dead, through the Veil of Tears, but in the wrong direction. In the prologue of Clash, Crescent actually talks to his gargoyles and thinks about them talking back, only to scold himself for being crazy. He's not crazy, but again, we see the idea of the gargoyles coming to life. I think it's all pretty clear. Gargoyles in A Song of Ice and Fire are fiery hell beasts woken from stone and they make up one aspect of Azor High Reborn, the flying moon meteor. And there they are, sitting atop the oldest part of Winterfell. What does this mean? Well, the fact that the Winterfell gargoyles are so worn that you cannot tell what specific creatures they are is quite suspicious to me. If George had put dragons on the walls of Winterfell, after all, we'd look at it quite differently, wouldn't we? I suggested last time that Winterfell and Ned himself are symbols of the destroyed second moon that gave birth to dragons. This would be the fire moon in my hypothesized ice moon, fire moon scenario. But wait, isn't Winterfell and House Stark a symbol of the north, the cold and frozen lands? Well, actually, what Winterfell is, is a bulwark against the cold. It's situated on top of a geothermal hotspot, as evidenced by its hot pools which are pumped through its walls like veins of warm blood. Of all the rooms in Winterfell's great keep, Catelyn's bedchambers were the hottest. She seldom had to light a fire. The castle had been built over natural hot springs, and the scalding waters rushed through its walls and chambers like blood through a man's body, driving the chill from the stone halls, filling the glass gardens with the moist warmth, keeping the earth from freezing. Open pools smoked day and night in a dozen small courtyards. That was a little thing in summer. In winter, it was the difference between life and death. Winterfell is warm and smoking. It's a beating heart which may be the difference between life and death. Here's Jon Snow making the same analogy between hot blood and the hot water at Winterfell in a game of thrones. So cold, he thought, remembering the warm halls of Winterfell where the hot waters ran through the walls like blood through a man's body. There was scant warmth to be found in Castle Black. The walls were cold here, and the people colder. It's often said that Winterfell is the heart of the North, and we can see that it's a warm heart which pumps hot water through its stone walls like blood. At the heart of Winterfell, of course, we have the heart tree, with its bloody hands and mouth, and its leaves like bits of flame, and also its eyes weeping tears of blood. That's a lot of warmth. 
and a lot of blood. Many have suggested that the name Winterfell might imply that it was the place where winter fell, as in the place where winter was defeated. The king of winter rules over winter like a defeated subject, in other words. This idea is reinforced by the description of the crown of the king of winter, which we receive in A Clash of Kings. Lord Hoster Smith had done his work well, and Rob's crown looked much as the other was said to have looked in the tales told of the Stark kings of old, an open circlet of hammered bronze incised with the runes of the first men, surmounted by nine black iron spikes wrought in the shape of longswords. Of gold and silver and gemstones, it had none. Bronze and iron were the metals of winter, dark and strong to fight against the cold. To fight against the cold. The king of winter fights against the cold, and his castle is a warm beating heart and a bulwark against the cold, and it's covered in hellish gargoyles of one sort or another. The king of winter has a beast at his side, too, the direwolf. We've seen that all the stark direwolves have eyes explicitly described to be fiery, and we've seen that the direwolves seem to be playing into the archetype of the fiery hellhound, guardians of the underworld. Who is this king of winter anyway, with his dark metals and fiery hellhounds and his loathing of the forces of the cold? Gargoyles warred against evil spirits, and the evilest spirits around are of course the others, demons made of ice. It makes sense to see fiery gargoyles and hellhounds warding against icy demons, right? This seems like a good time to mention that Winterfell, as a proper second moon symbol, is famously burnt and cracked open. Theon reflects thusly in A Dance with Dragons. The great stronghold of House Stark was a scorched desolation. And later in the same book, Theon again. Only a shell remained, one side open to the elements and filling up with snow. Rubble was strewn all about it. Great chunks of shattered masonry, burned beams, broken gargoyles. The falling snow had covered almost all of it, but part of one gargoyle still poked above the drift, its grotesque face snarling sightless at the sky. This is where they found Bran when he fell. That's a nice tie-in between falling brands and falling gargoyles. One gargoyle lies broken, staring sightlessly, just as Bran lay broken in that very spot before he gained his magical sight. This is also the spot where the dead body of little Walder was found. The line was, Under that ruined keep, my lord, the one with the old gargoyles. You'll recall that little Walder appears to Theon in the haze of the snow and mist of the godswood as a red bull right before he's killed, and sacrificed bulls are a recognizable sacrificed moon symbol. Fallen moon children, fallen gargoyles, fallen red bulls, all the same idea. These are dragons which hatch from the moon in a burst of blood and fire and fall to earth landing with great trauma. The thing I really want to draw your attention to in this passage is the use of the word shell to describe Winterfell, something which occurs several times. This is John, also in dance. The castle is a shell, he said. Not Winterfell, but the ghost of Winterfell. When Bran surveys the devastation of Ramsay's burning, he observes... The first keep had not been used for many hundreds of years, but now it was more of a shell than ever. The floors had burned inside it, and all the beams. Where the wall had fallen away, they could see right into the rooms, even into the privy. It's a burnt-out shell, once again. And of course, we know what hatched from that shell. The smoke and ash clouded his eyes, and in the sky he saw a great winged snake, whose roar was a river of flame. He bared his teeth, but then the snake was gone. Behind the cliffs, tall fires were eating up the stars. That was Bran's vision through Summer's eyes of what sounds an awful lot like a dragon taken from A Clash of Kings. I will address whether or not I think that was a real dragon on some other occasion, tease tease, but for now it serves to make the point that when Winterfell was burned and cracked open like a shell, a dragon hatching is depicted. A bit later in the chapter, right after that quote about the first keep being more of a shell than ever before, Osha declares that, they made enough noise to wake a dragon. Right before that, we get this paragraph. The sky was a pale gray, and smoke eddied all around them. They stood in the shadow of the first keep, or what remained of it. One whole side of the building had torn loose and fallen away. Stone and shattered gargoyles lay strewn across the yard. They fell just where I did, Bran thought when he saw them. Some of the gargoyles had broken into so many pieces it made him wonder how he was alive at all. 
Nearby, some crows were pecking at a body crushed beneath the tumbled stone, but he lay face down, and Bran could not say who he was. Here we can see another equation between Bran and the gargoyles, both of which fell from the tower and landed in the same spot. It's an identical comparison to the one Theon made in Book 5, here in a Bran chapter of Book 2. Bran's fall was depicting the moon disaster, just as the fire which gutted Winterfell was, and the body which tumbled face down in this scene is more of the same. The moon fell face down, that's the idea. All of the fallen objects are broken or dead or crushed, indicating the dead, undead nature of Azor Ahai Reborn and the association of death which Lightbringer bears. It's worth noting that the gargoyles of Dragonstone also fell from the walls when Daenerys was born. Daenerys Stormborn, she was called, for she had come howling into the world on distant Dragonstone as the greatest storm in the memory of Westeros howled outside. A storm so fierce that it ripped gargoyles from the castle walls and smashed her father's fleet to kindling. We've talked about the idea of incredible storms accompanying the birth of Azor Ahai Reborn, the storm of sword meteors to be specific, and how this is manifest in the story of Danny being born during a legendary storm which flung gargoyles from the walls of Dragonstone. Dragonstone, in turn, is one of the first symbols of the second moon and its meteor children that we discovered, and like Winterfell, we have gargoyles falling to the ground or coming to life when symbolic lightbringer forgings occur. These repeated parallels between the two fortresses further solidify the interpretation of Winterfell as a symbol of the moon which was destroyed by fire and which gave birth to dragon meteors. Returning to Bran surveying the ruins of Winterfell, we have this. It took the rest of the morning to make a slow circuit of the castle. The great granite walls remained, blackened here and there by fire, but otherwise untouched. But within, all was death and destruction. Walls blackened by fire may be another parallel to Dragonstone, whose walls were all burnt black by dragonfire. More importantly, this quote reinforces the shell idea. The blackened walls are the shell, and inside the egg is fire and death and destruction. Dragons, in other words. Or, if you prefer, the fiery heart of a star, one which becomes a flying dragon. I'm tempted to wonder if Martin is making a super nerdy joke about Lightbringer and electricity here. They made a slow circuit of the broken shell. Get it? Circuit? Lightbringer? Huh? Huh? Thomas Edison fans in the room? Anyone? So to sum up, Winterfell is a symbol of the destroyed second moon, the potential fire moon which gave birth to dragons. The King of Winter has hellhounds and dark metals to fight the cold. He lives in an oasis of warmth, the warm heart of the north. His castle is festooned with gargoyles, just like a dragonlord fortress. What's going on here? Well, if there's a connection between Azor Ahai, who is definitely from the east and affiliated with dragons and fire magic, and the last hero, who is from Westeros and strongly affiliated with the Starks, then somehow the Starks should have some ancient connection with dragons and fire magic. And indeed, they seem to. I think George has hidden this fact in plain sight, actually. Consider, the first time we saw Winterfell, we saw Ned Stark cleaning the blood off of his smoke-dark dragonforged sword in the black waters of the Godswood Pond. This is clearly one of the most important early scenes in the book, and in it, we find Lord Stark, our stand-in for the King of Winter, honing and admiring his black dragon sword with the dark glow. The very first scene with Eddard was the execution of the runaway Night's Watch brother, and again, his black ice sword features prominently. Think about it. The first thing we ever see Ned do is cover his dragon sword in human blood. And yes, that's deserving of another dun-dun-dun. I've come to the opinion that right here, right at the beginning of the first book, we are being shown the King of Winter archetype. Dark metals to fight the cold. Honestly, that sounds like the idea of Lightbringer the Black Sword fighting the forces of winter, a.k.a. the Others. And that's just what John dreams of, fighting the cold forces from the lands of always winter with the black Valyrian steel sword which burns red, with black ice armor to remind us of Ned's black sword called ice. And speaking of John and heroes, we have this from A Dance with Dragons about Winterfell and John. When John had been a boy at Winterfell, his hero had been the young dragon, the boy king who had conquered Dorne at the age of 14. Despite his bastard birth, or perhaps because of it, Jon Snow had dreamed of leading men to glory just as King Daeron had, of growing up to be a conqueror. From young dragon to Lord Snow, meaning King of Winter, 
Is this the path of Azor Ahai the Conqueror, or perhaps his son? It's definitely a nice clue about John being a dragon person. A John the Conqueror, if you will. Kidding aside, let me be clear. I think the clues indicate that the King of Winter, who may or may not have been Brandon the Builder or the Last Hero or the Night's King or any combination of those three, may have had at least some dragon lineage. In particular, I'm imagining Azor Ahai or his son marrying a Westerosi woman of First Men heritage to found the line of House Stark, the kings of winter who fight the cold with dark metals and hot castles and fiery hellhounds and gargoyles. Whew, that was exciting! Dragons and Winterfell and the king of winter unmasked as a fiery dude who actually is not so fond of the cold. You better believe I'm going to come back to all of that. As I mentioned last time, the last hero clues just kind of seem to come in drips and drabs as we study other things. This essay is mainly about Tyrion, but the clues about the gargoyles led to that mini-episode about Winterfell and the King of Winter and the Last Hero, and far be it for me to edit cool stuff like that out of my podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, I'm glad I included it. Now, let's bring things back to Tyrion by examining a couple of passages in which he's called a gargoyle, and we'll just sort of see what we find. We already covered the first occurrence of Tyrion the Gargoyle at Winterfell, and the next one is to be found in A Clash of Kings. It's a humdinger, and it opens the chapter. Motionless as a gargoyle, Tyrion Lannister hunched on one knee atop a merlin. Beyond the mud gate and the desolation that had once been the fish market and wharves, the river itself seemed to have taken fire. Half of Stannis's fleet was ablaze, along with most of Joffrey's. The kiss of wildfire turned proud ships into funeral pyres and men into living torches. The air was full of smoke and arrows and screams. Right off the bat, we take note of the fact that King's Landing was built by dragon people. Thus, it's entirely fitting to find a gargoyle like Tyrion atop its walls. That gargoyle is a dragon, after all, according to theory. We see a burned hellscape of desolation and the deadly kiss of fire which consumes everything it touches, just like the sun which kissed the moon and cracked it open. Notice what the fiery kiss does. It turns men into living torches. Think of Beric, animated by fire magic, who was brought back by the fiery kiss. And thus we see once again the idea that undead fire beings were a result of the forging of Lightbringer. Human torches, if you will. The kiss also turns wooden ships into funeral pyres, evoking the funeral pyre of Khal Drogo and the smoke which rises from the meteor impacts to blot out the stars. As I mentioned before, Tyrion is the protector of King's Landing, and here he is, literally perching on its walls like a gargoyle, overseeing his efforts to ward the city. This is actually the chapter where Tyrion rides out into battle in defense of the city, making his protection role a direct and visceral one. Besides his own person, The main weapon which he employed to save King's Landing was his wildfire, the Jade Demon, as it's called, during the battle. Here's the next paragraph. Downstream, commoners and highborn captains alike could see the hot green death swirling towards their rafts and carracks and ferries, born on the current of the Blackwater. Blackwater and green fire. A match for Tyrion's green and black eyes, perhaps? Color symbolism is always quite subjective, so who knows? But I thought I would point it out. The chapter continues with an appearance of the Last Hero Math, a group of twelve great fires led by one even more terrible fire, which is Tyrion's demon. A dozen great fires raged under the city walls, where casks of burning pitch had exploded. But the wildfire reduced them to no more than candles in a burning house, their orange and scarlet pennons fluttering insignificantly against the jade holocaust. The low clouds caught the color of the burning river and roofed the sky in shades of shifting green, eerily beautiful, a terrible beauty, like dragonfire. Tyrion wondered if Aegon the Conqueror had felt like this as he flew above his field of fire. Well, that was fairly on the nose, wasn't it? Oh, that's right. I guess I shouldn't make nose jokes about Tyrion. It kind of goes without saying, but in this scene, we see Tyrion's jade demon compared to dragonfire, and Tyrion might feel kind of like Aegon the Conqueror, because he's a secret Targaryen. There's also not one, but two monkey demon references connected to Tyrion's protection of King's Landing, which I save for just this moment. One of the chapters before the Battle of the Blackwater closes with Tyrion musing about how the people of the city don't have one of their shining heroic knights to save them, but only the one they hate, the dwarf, the evil counselor, the twisted little monkey demon. 
In another scene before the battle, Tyrion commands Bronn to gather a hundred men and burn everything you see between the water's edge and the city walls in order to deny Stannis wood for scaling ladders. Bronn suggests that the lowly peasants, mm, you know, won't take kindly to all that, to which Tyrion quips, they'll have something else to curse the evil monkey demon for. Tyrion the monkey demon is employing fire as a weapon to protect the city on multiple occasions, and sometimes the fire itself is a demon, and sometimes it looks like dragon fire. This all plays into the themes of using dark weapons and dark powers related to fire to potentially save the day, which we've seen many times now. Well, that was a pretty good one. Let's go to our next Tyrion as a gargoyle quote from a Sansa chapter of A Storm of Swords. Queen Cersei studied her critically. A few gems, I think, the moonstones Joffrey gave her. At once, your grace, her maid replied. When the moonstones hung from Sansa's ears and about her neck, the queen nodded. Yes, the gods have been kind to you, Sansa. You are a lovely girl. It seems almost obscene to squander such sweet innocence on that gargoyle. What gargoyle? Sansa did not understand. Besides the moonstones draped over Sansa's kissed-by-fire head of auburn hair, Cersei also fastens a white maiden's cloak about Sansa, which is heavy with pearls. Moonstones and pearls, white pearls at least, are both symbols of a pure, shining moon, one that has not been penetrated by the burning dragon seed or burning dragon swords. It's such a shame wasting an excellent moon maiden on a gargoyle like Tyrion. Now Tyrion represents the gargoyle version of Azor High Reborn, which is a child of sun and moon. His lion nature reflects his dad's genes, if you will, the fact that the sun is Azor High Reborn's father. Azor Ahai transforms into Azor Ahai Reborn when Lightbringer is forged and the moon cracks, when the long night falls and the sun turns dark, of course, and so we can see that giving an innocent moon maiden to the likes of an Azor Ahai Reborn character is indeed an obscene act. The thing is, Tyrion is not like his father the sun, who's all about Tyrion forcing himself on Sansa. Tyrion refuses to do this, and instead he protects Sansa's chastity and autonomy, like a true gargoyle, leaving the choice of consummation up to her. He also protected Sansa from the beatings of the Kingsguard, which came at the behest of another ravenous solar king, Joffrey. Again, this protection role is a match for Sandor, a hellhound version of Azor Ahai Reborn, who also protects Sansa from rape at the hands of the mob during the riot, and then he protects her from Joffrey when Sansa speaks up for Dantos at Joffrey's name day tournament. You remember that whole thing about what a man sows on his name day he reaps throughout the year, right? In other words, the takeaway here is that Moon Maiden Sansa is protected by hellhounds and gargoyles. Once again, if Tyrion were to end up protecting Daenerys, it would match the symbolism perfectly. Sansa and Daenerys are Moon Maidens with very similar imagery as we've seen. Consider also that Tyrion's great shame is that he did not protect his first love, Tysha. Instead, he did nothing while a hundred of his father's guardsmen raped her. And then, of course, Tyrion himself followed and raped her as well. This is a deep violation of Tyrion's calling to protect Moon Maidens, and accordingly, it haunts him throughout his storyline. Similarly, he choked Shay until her face turned black, and this too haunts his memories. Of course, Shay's face turning black is a vivid depiction of the moon turning black when it's killed. The opening of the fiery hand of the king in the sky was the death of the moon, and Shay dies with golden hands embedded in her flesh. There's another occasion of Tyrion being called a gargoyle in Storm, when Sandor curses out Tyrion to Arya as he sets out to take her to the twins for your uncle's bloody wedding, a.k.a. the Red Wedding. That passage is mostly about Sandor, so I've chosen not to quote it, but it involves Sandor declaring that he is through with the Lannisters and leaving King's Landing, which is a depiction of the Hellhounds flying from the sun, landing, and then turning against the sun as they throw up the smoke which blots out the sun's face. This may also be another clue about the last hero turning against his evil father, Zor High or perhaps about Azor Ahai's sword being taken from him and used against him to undo his evil deeds. In A Feast for Crows, we get a Tyrion gargoyle reference when Cersei receives a severed dwarf's head, which is not Tyrion's, and says, There are gargoyles on Dragonstone that look more like the imp than this creature. That's a pretty sweet tie-in to Dragonstone. Tyrion has now been associated with gargoyles on all three of the castles we've discussed. Winterfell, King's Landing and now Dragonstone. The plot didn't provide a convenient way for Tyrion to perch on Dragonstone's walls like a gargoyle, as he did at Winterfell and King's Landing, 
but this comparison by Cersei does the trick nicely. Once again, the fact that King's Landing and Dragonstone were both built by dragon people kind of raises the possibility that the first keep of Winterfell was built by dragon people too. There's a few lines worth looking at leading up to Cersei's line about Tyrion as the would-be informers present Cersei with their head. He laid his hand upon his chest. I bring you justice. I bring you the head of your Valancar. The old Valyrian word sent a chill through her, though it also gave her a tingle of hope. The imp is no longer my brother, if he ever was, she declared. Nor will I say his name. It was a proud name once, before he dishonored it. In Tyrosh we name him Red Hands for the blood running from his fingers. A king's blood and a father's. Some say he slew his mother too, ripping his way from her womb with savage claws. What nonsense, Cersei thought. Tis true, she said. If the imp's head is in that chest, I shall raise you to lordship and grant you rich lands and keeps. That's a fabulous description of Azor Ahai Reborn, the dragon, ripping its way out of its moon mother's shell. Red hands is a nice one, tying into the well-established bleeding and burning hands symbolic motif. Well-established anyway, if you've been listening to the podcast in order, which I highly recommend. Tyrion killed his father, too, as everyone well remembers, and this is simply another depiction of the moon meteors, children of the sun and moon, turning against their sun father by darkening the sky with ash and smoke. I have to say, I think it's becoming increasingly likely that the original Azor Ahai had a son who turned against him. Remember that the term Azor Ahai Reborn can refer to either a child of Azor Ahai or to a resurrected Azor Ahai, and my best guess is that we had both the first time around. An undead dad and a son who went against his father. Perhaps the son slew the father, who was then resurrected. That's taken the whole Oedipus thing to a whole new level, right? Son slays father, father rises from the dead, sacrifices son in blood magic ritual on altar made of ice? Something like that, surely. We saw this idea of two Azor High Reborn figures clashing a moment ago in the idea that Sandor, the hellhound version of Azor High Reborn, wishes death on Tyrion, the gargoyle version of Azor High Reborn. We also see it in the Battle of Blackwater Bay itself, when the army led by Tyrion clashes against that of Stannis, a distinct Azor High Reborn figure in his own right. I think we have to ask the question, is this a conflict between Azor High Reborn, the resurrected dad, and Azor High Reborn, the child? Or were there more than one child? It seems possible, since we have all this in the current story about the three heads of the dragon, and the original three heads of the dragon, Aegon, Visenya, and Rhaenys, were all siblings. That's a hole we'll have to fall down another time, for sure. It's safe to say there is a lot of familial conflict of every sort in A Song of Ice and Fire, and it's likely that a lot of this is echoing familial conflicts from the Dawn Age. Our final Tyrion as Gargoyle reference comes from A Dance with Dragons, and it's actually from the same chapter where Makoro sees Tyrion snarling amidst all the dragons in a fire vision. This is from the page before that vision, as Tyrion feels empathy for Penny the dwarf girl. And the sight of me can only be salt in her wound. They hacked off her brother's head in the hope that it was mine. Yet here I sit like some bloody gargoyle, offering empty consolations. If I were her, I'd want nothing more than to shove me into the sea. Tyrion does indeed play the protective gargoyle for Penny all through their time together, so we can see that this is an apt evocation of the gargoyle aspect of Tyrion's character. Tyrion is a bloody gargoyle, even better, and perhaps he should be shoved into the sea like some sort of falling sea dragon. We've seen many references to moon or moon meteor drownings throughout these essays, and this is yet another. You'll remember when Bran's head swam, for example. The equivalency drawn between Tyrion and Penny's dead brother is another suggestion of Azor Ahai Reborn as being a dead person. The quote continues. He felt nothing but pity for the girl. She did not deserve the horror visited on her in Volantis any more than her brother had. The last time he had seen her, just before they left port, her eyes had been raw from crying, two ghastly red holes in a wan, pale face. By the time they raised sail, she had locked herself in her cabin with her dog and her pig. But at night they could hear her weeping. Only yesterday he had heard one of the mates say that they ought to throw her overboard before her tears could swamp the ship. Tyrion was not entirely sure he had been japing. Penny seems to be playing a pure moon maiden role here. She's a weeping maiden with two ghastly red holes for eyes, 
and she has a wan, pale face. That's the wan light of a moon, pale face, and the torn-out eyes of the moon, which become bleeding stars. The side-by-side -side appearance of tears and torn-out eyes is impossible to miss at this point, and unmistakable as well. I don't have to summarize that whole moon tears, eyeless skulls thing again, do I? No, no, Alamo, we've had enough, dear God. We've talked about it enough, I trust. Penny's tears might even swamp the ship. That's a flood tide of tears, in other words, enough to drown things. Finally, we see a parallel to the idea of throwing Tyrion into the sea, as moon maiden Penny is also associated with being thrown into the sea. Elsewhere in the same chapter, there's also mention of Penny becoming suicidal and jumping into the sea. Sea dragon moon meteors drown in the ocean, and then drown whole islands. Get it? Also recall that pennies are called copper stars in Westeros, so the weeping, eyeless, moon-faced Penny, who was drowned in the sea, also shows us a star having its eyes torn out, weeping a flood tide, and drowning in the sea. Once again, I'm left to marvel at the density of Martin's mythical astronomy. He touched on all these ideas in multiple ways in the space of just two paragraphs. And it took me like four paragraphs just to explain it. And then, just a moment later, Mokoro sees Tyrion snarling and casting long shadows in the midst of dragons. There's another line about Penny here, as Tyrion suggests that perhaps it was Penny Mokoro saw in his dream. This makes sense because Penny is a moon maiden, and dragons come from the moon. Well, that does it for the gargoyle. I think it's a fabulous use of real-world myth, and we can see that Tyrion has a well-established track record of protecting moon maidens. Again, I think it's pretty likely Tyrion will be doing the same for the penultimate moon maiden, Daenerys Targaryen. And I ask you, what better way to protect a moon maiden like Daenerys than by riding on the back of a dragon? White Dragons on the Winds I'll close this podcast by leaving you with a possible foreshadowing of Tyrion's future dragon riding, and this is the very mild spoiler from one of Tyrion's Winds of Winter sample chapters which I spoke of at the beginning. I left it at the end so you can tune out if you don't want Winds of Winter spoilers for whatever reason. If that's the case, thanks for listening and see you later everyone. This scene takes place in the command tent of the Second Sons, where a Yunkishman comes in to give more incredibly foolish battle commands to Brown Ben Plum, the captain of the Second Sons. You'll recall that the Second Sons betrayed Daenerys by turning their cloaks and going over to the Yunkish forces near the end of A Dance with Dragons. In this scene, Tyrion has been trying to convince Brown Ben to go back over to Daenerys, who now seems like the winning side. The Yunkishman arrives with his crappy orders. Out went Kem. When he returned, he held the tent flap open for a Yunkish nobleman in a cloak of yellow silk and matching pantaloons. The man's oily black hair had been tortured, twisted, and lacquered to make it seem as if a hundred tiny roses were sprouting from his head. On his breastplate was a scene of such delightful depravity that Tyrion sensed a kindred spirit. Oily black roses which have been tortured and twisted. You guys caught that one, right? That's the moonflower of oily black stone, unfolding like an iron rose, such as we saw with Tywin's army at the Battle of the Green Fork. The Yunkishman is called Kindred and wears yellow to draw an analogy to Tywin, the solar character, who wields the Iron Rose. In fact, Tyrion recalls that battle scene at the Green Fork in this Winds chapter just a couple of pages previous, and uses the same symbolic language that we saw all the way back in the first book. I was just recalling my first battle, the Green Fork. We fought between a river and a road. When I saw my father's host deploy, I remember thinking how beautiful it was, like a flower opening its petals to the sun, a crimson rose with iron thorns. And my father, ah, he had never looked so resplendent. He wore crimson armor with this huge great cloak made of cloth of gold, a pair of golden lions on his shoulders, another on his helm. His stallion was magnificent. His lordship watched the whole battle from atop that horse and never got within a hundred yards of any foe. He never moved, never smiled, never broke a sweat, whilst thousands died below him. Picture me perched on a camp stool, gazing down upon a cypher's board. We could almost be twins. If I had a horse, some crimson armor, and a great cloak sewn from cloth of gold, 
He was taller too. I have more hair. Penny kissed him. The moon wandered too close to the sun and kissed it. Chuckle, chuckle. The choice to use the same symbolic language about the Iron Rose, six books and twenty years apart, shows specific intention on the part of the author, I would suggest. And the Black Rose theme is reinforced by the oily black hair of the Yunkishman that is tortured to look like roses. Previously, on Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire, we have examined a long series of solar characters who have some sort of black moon weapon symbol, beginning with Tywin's unfolding Iron Rose. And also including Jon Snow's rivers of black ice and black ice armor, Drogo's oily black hair, which is like a river of darkness, Jaime and Joffrey's waves of blood and night swords, Widow's whale and oathkeeper, and Oberyn's oily black sun spear. I forgot to mention last time, by the way, that Oberyn's eyes are described in A Storm of Swords as being as black and shiny as coal oil. As you can see, the oily black rose hair of the yellow-cloaked Yunkishman fits very tightly into this established pattern, and presented in close proximity to the repetition of the Iron Rose Army idea. Well, let's just say it's not a coincidence. The thing to remember is that this is a depiction of the sun using the moon as a black weapon. So while all these characters are solar figures, their symbolism also includes the moon, and that is where the black and bloody tides and black sword meteors come from. In Tyrion's memory of the battle scene at the Green Fork, Tywin watches atop his horse like a sun in the sky, and this is compared to Tyrion watching the Sybas table from atop his stool. They could almost be twins. Tywin's Iron Rose army is drawn as an equivalent to Tyrion's Sybas pieces, and this is where the dragon riding clue comes in. After our oily rose-headed Yunkishman gives his commands, Jora offers a second opinion. Mormont's longsword was in his hand. As the rider turned, Sir Jora thrust it through his throat. The point came out the back of the Yunkishman's neck, red and wet. The infamous bloody red sword, a face-down sun figure, a pool of blood and oily black roses. That's a nice summary of episodes two and three of the podcast, complete with references to bloody tides, black moon flowers, and oily black stone. Now, just as Tyrion, the twisted monkey demon, killed his solar father figure, this oily youngish solar figure has been killed by Jora, who wears the demon mask. Once again, we see the idea that the son is killed by a demon spawn, which would be a Zora High Reborn, the son's own son, a second son, if you will, like Jora and Tyrion in this scene are second sons. And then comes the dragon reference. The white Sivas dragon ended up at Tyrion's feet. He scooped it off the carpet and wiped it on his sleeve. But some of the yunkish blood had collected in the fine grooves of the carving, so the pale wood seemed veined with red. All hail our beloved Queen Daenerys, be she alive or be she dead. He tossed the bloody dragon in the air, caught it, grinned. We have always been the queen's men, announced Brown Ben Plum. Rejoining the yunkai was just a ploy. And what a clever ploy it was! Tyrion gave the dead man a shove with his boot. If that breastplate fits, I want it. Viserion, the white dragon, has just been flying above the battle scene and eating corpses as they are flung into the air by the catapults. So I think there can be little doubt that this bloody white dragon, which Tyrion claims, is a reference to Viserion, if it's a reference to anything at all. There's also a link drawn to the weirwood, pale wood veined with red. And of course, this makes us think of Blood Raven, whose sigil is a white dragon, and who is transforming into a weirwood. There's a whole mysterious connection between white dragons and weirwood. You'll notice this coloring matches ghosts as well, and this we'll have to save for another day. But the chess analogy here is quite clear. Tyrion deploys the chess pieces just as Tywin deploys his army. Tywin's army is a black iron rose, and Tyrion's is a bloody white dragon. This connection was reinforced with a line earlier, which was Tyrion saying. This is just a Sivas game to the wise masters. We're the pieces. They have that in common with my lord father. These slavers. We are the pieces, he says, and the pieces are a bloody white dragon. Tyrion is a bloody white dragon, in other words, and perhaps he'll ride one too, deploying it like a chess piece to protect his dragon queen. Tyrion tosses the dragon into the air. That's where you ride them, after all, and then says, "All hail Queen Daenerys." Last but not least. 
Tyrion wants the breastplate of the dead sun figure, the one with all those depraved scenes, despite the fact that it might have blood and black oil on it. Tyrion has always wanted that magic armor from Valyria, right? As a monkey demon following in the tradition of Sheng Wukong, he needs a suit of dragon armor. Earlier, Tyrion remarks that he would be just like Tywin if only he had that splendid armor. Well, he's getting the armor of the sun, but it's the armor of a dead sun, the dead solar king we know as the black dragon, Azor Ahai Reborn. Attentive listeners will remember that we quoted a scene earlier where Tyrion plays Syvas with young Griff, a.k.a. probably Fagon Blackfire, and Tyrion was noted to move the black dragon around the board instead of the white one that he has in this scene. Like Jess, Syvas has a black and a white wooden army, as they are called, and it's interesting to compare Tyrion's role as dragon advisor in the two scenes. When he had the black dragon, the yin side if you will, He was deceiving young Griff, both on the game board and in his strategic advice and manipulation. In this scene here with the white dragon, it certainly appears that Tyrion is genuinely on team Daenerys. This recalls Sheng Wukong's nature as a trickster god who can push the balance in either direction. I'll close by mentioning that there's actually a white dragon in the story of Sheng Wukong told in Journey to the West. Later in life, after escaping from the mountain under which the Buddha has imprisoned him, Sheng Wukong works to atone for his evil deeds by playing the role of protector to the main character in the second half of the story. That's a nice overlap to the protection aspect of Gargoyles, surely. The horse of this hero, who's protected by Sheng Wukong, is eaten by a dragon prince who takes the form of a white dragon. Sheng Wukong then fights and drives off the white dragon, who retreats underwater. Sheng Wukong will not be denied, however, and tracks him down, after which the white dragon transforms into a kind of dragon horse and serves as the new steed for the hero in the second half of the journey. Sheng Wukong himself doesn't ride the white dragon, but he does subdue it and gain its loyalty, and then Sheng Wukong serves the rider of the dragon. As we've seen, George never writes his stories and characters as exact one-to-one correlations to their mythological forefathers, so I think the important takeaway here is simply that Sheng Wukong has a white dragon on his team, and it's my prediction that Tyrion will soon have the same. Thanks for listening, everyone, and I need to give a bit of credit where credit is due. There were a few essays by others that proved handy as I was writing this, which I'll have links to on the WordPress version of this podcast. My buddy from the Westeros.org forums, known as Mithras, has two essays worthy of note here. One is called A Theory on the Evil Twisted Little Monkey Demon, which has analysis on the monkey demon quotes, and another one which is simply recommended reading, called Danny's Dragon Riders, which talks about the idea of Tyrion riding Viserion. My buddy Pobeb from the A Song of Ice and Fire subreddit has written a nice piece called Tyrion, Gargoyles, and the Implications. I'm pretty sure that's a clever imp word pun. Implications, get it? And I recommend that as a supplement of this essay as well. Pobeb made the astute observation that the gargoyle statues on top of medieval buildings served not only to ward off evil spirits, but to divert rainwater off the roof. And this is manifest in the fact that Tyrion was given the job of making sure all the drains and cisterns in Casterly Rock flowed smoothly which he achieved with brilliant success. That's a very clever gargoyle reference there, and a nice catch by Pobeb. As a final note on Sheng Wukong, there's actually a major studio Chinese 3D action movie in the works based on Journey to the West, set for release sometime in 2016. The White Dragon Horse is on the cover, and Sheng Wukong will feature prominently. I'm definitely looking forward to that one. With any luck, the movie will be released right around the time of episode 9 of the HBO show, When Tyrion Rides a Dragon. This is LML signing off. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. The staves were matched, but made of different iron. The weapons clashed, but their masters were not the same. One was a wayward immortal known as the Great Sage, the other a true dragon disciple of Guan Yin. The cast iron staff, beaten with a thousand hammers, had been forged by the art of Ding and Jia. The as-you-will cudgel once anchored the Milky Way, 
As the treasure stealing the sea, its magic power was great. When the two met, they were well matched indeed, and they parried and lunged at each other without end. The sinister cudgel, infinitely murderous, could whirl round your waist as quick as the wind. The spear-catching staff, never yielding an opening, was irresistible, parrying to right and left. On one side, the flags and banners fly. On the other side, the camel drums roll. Ten thousand heavenly generals in multiple encirclement, a cave of monkey devils densely packed together. Monstrous fogs and evil clouds cover the earth, while the smoke of deadly battle rises to the sky. Yesterday's fighting was bad enough. Today's struggle is even worse. The admirable skills of the Monkey King put Mosca to flight, utterly defeated.